Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Okay, Mr. Thompson, I think you have the honor. Okay. <coughs> oh, that was me. <laughs> Don't y'all all feel secure that I'm in charge of you? You shouldn't be. So, we'll be glad I'm not your doctor. So, I'm just going to ask us all to bow our heads and, and pray real quick. Heavenly Father, I am just so thankful for you to have us here to lead this county and lead our county with these fine folks because it is their county. Dear God, please help us to always keep our eyes focused on you and make sure that we never take our eyes off because we always stray when we do. Give us the strength and the wisdom and the discernment to make the choices that you would have us make. In, <coughs> your, honor. In your name I pray, amen. Let's stand and say I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This is why the five of us ran for office. This next presentation, um, I assume Officer Miles is who you want to bring forward, and Mr. And I'm going to ask the five county commissioners to step down with the sheriff and the rest of the group so that we can shake hands with this honorable person. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the life-saving work for this gentleman right here and the author who wrote Lieutenant. is going to present and do the reading. Outstanding. All right. On Tuesday, November 24, 2022, at approximately 6.33 p.m., Detention Officer Kenneth Miles was making a routine security check in M-Block. Officer Miles discovered an inmate in his cell choking on something that he had eaten. Officer Miles immediately called for assistance and entered the cell to begin performing the Heimlich maneuver, which, by the way, cleared the inmate's airway. The inmate was then taken to medical for further evaluation where he was cleared to return to the cell. Uh, for Officer Miles' quick action and training resulting in saving the inmate's life, I, Lieutenant Stephen Myers, am recommending him for the life saving award. You'll be getting that award now here. Mm -hmm. It says life saving award presented to attention officer Kenneth Miles recognized your actions that resulted in life saving mm -hmm. on November 24, 2022. <coughs> Young man, thank you for your service to Dalmets County Sheriff's Office. Thank you, sir. Good amen. And if amen. you will allow us, we would like to shake your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Your lesson. Thank you. Thanks for all your hard work. Thank you for representing me in this county in a, in a professional way, young man. Thank you.
to the top rows. Thank you. Do we have a motion as to the agenda? Motion to approve. Second. In discussion, there being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. We have two public comments. Um, and Mayor McCollum, yeah. please come forward. You were hiding behind Terry Johnson. I didn't see. <laughs> <laughs> I do that. I Good to hide. <laughs> Good evening. How are you my doing name, tonight? My name is Sandra McCollum, Mayor Green Level. Thank you for having me. I have heard many different reports and updates on why the Public Safety Training Center is delayed starting construction. There was reports pertaining to legal matters, lease agreement, short of construction uh, materials because of COVID increased cost of materials because of COVID. And the last update, the soil had to be tested. I'm taking back that some of these structures are almost completed that was listed in a 2018 revolution of the trustees of Alamance uh, County Community College requesting the Alamance County Board of uh, Commissioner to authorize a special advisory referendum on the issue of $39,600,000 of general obligation bonds for approving Alamance County Community College's facilities. This public safety training center was listed under Section 1 in this revolution. The con construction of some of these facilities listed in this revolution under Section 1 have started, maybe preparing for the ribbon cutting. I'm thinking the training center should have been in a close running with the other facilities since the resident voted on the bonds for this center. It seems that each time the commissioners vote to increase funds and you have done this, something else comes up. Now the problem about the soil really has me wondering. There were three houses that was occupied by families for years near where the construction site is for the center. The brick home was three to four bedrooms, and these houses were not undesirable structures. As I understand it, Martin Marietta moved the houses and the families out because, and the, demolished the houses because of the company's growth. All these years, I have not heard about a soil, a soil problem at Martin Marietta property, and I have had a few meetings with the company because they are in our ETJ. Meeting pertaining to other concerns, not dirt. I do not know if there are other interests for the training center or to be in another town or, or for some other reason, but I do remember in 2015 when Sheriff Johnson was excited and passionate about this project, and as far as I know, no, no other town or city wanted this, wanted this facility in their community. We are the only town, as far as I know, that was excited about the project coming to our community. I am aware that this is not a green level project. We have no say. We make no decision. And sorry, we do not have a million or two to contribute. But this is one thing that I do know. When we start thinking about each other how, and how much we are like in Alamance County, we will uh, have... Thank you so much. Board, can we allow her to Absolutely. continue? Absolutely. Yeah. Mayor, finish. finish, your, finish. Absolutely. Please finish. Go ahead and we finish. We don't have any speakers tonight. Um, well, I, I had finished. Just, just saying that um, I was saying when we stop thinking about how things can be different in this community and we start thinking about how much we are like in this community, then Alamance County will be blessed. 
to according to all our needs. And I really do believe this. And, but I had finished, but I just want to thank each one of you all for my space at your meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Henry, you get three minutes only. No, no <laughs> extensions. <laughs> <laughs> that partiality don't need absolutely I don't, need, really I, don't need, to, I don't need all, I don't need over my three minutes um my name is Henry Vines and uh, I live in snow camp on 3450 Isaac Drive commissioners I come I just wanted to uh express a little bit of concerns that uh, I read over the agenda and read into the packet uh the first thing I would uh like to speak on is the reading of of the uh Coble, Sand Rock, and uh, Dump that y'all are fixing to do for Meridian. Uh, there's there's a couple of concerns that I have on this, and that's where that uh, it's asking to go from 600,000 tons to 750,000 tons a day. Uh, the way I figure this, that could be approximately 10 more uh, dump truck loads of stuff coming in. And already 45 is allowed, you know, about 45 can come in a day now. The traffic on Spanish Oak Hill Road uh, at times is pretty bad. We have a lot of stuff that goes on there. Sheriff Johnson can just, uh, speak <laughs> right along because he lives on that road. He sees what goes on. We've had wrecks up in the curve and stuff, and fatalities have been linked to that. It's not the land's fault, field's fault. But to allow this to increase... Uh, even more and then the hundred mile radius instead of the 25 mile radius that's that's gonna just I think this company is if they buy this out they're going to utilize every amount of time of poundage that they can bring in um, the third thing is it was upsetting me is, is that uh, they're going to close the sand rock part of this when this started out uh, it's in that paper right there uh, when they started out with this, uh, Kent and them started this out. I was there when they first, and we met right down here on Graham about starting this sand rock. It was a needed thing for the community, for the community and the county, for builders and farmers like myself. We use a lot of sand rock filler and stuff that we have to have for chicken houses, for uh, our cattle lots and the different things <laughs> through the years. And, you know, it was a really vital thing for the uh community to to be able to have this you know service that he was providing and when he moved into the landfill part it only made sense i mean digging these big holes out there nothing in them you might well fill them up and you know it's stuff that's supposed to be coming in that's non-toxic or anything like that so it it was a win-win thing i mean was it a, a aggravation with all these trucks and stuff yeah but it's part of what you got to do but you're going to increase this traffic and this charlotte based company and they're wanting to expand their space they're going to utilize for they're going to utilize they're going to stage these things to where they can bring this stuff in and they're going to maximize their amount each day and something i'm not real clear on is you know whether they're going to have to upgrade their landfill to hydro rules and, and uh because we got another landfill that's going on and he's having to meet all the landfill rules and I think it's unfair to him if this new fellow is going to come in, he ought to have to bring his bring this up to standards. And so uh it's hope when y'all look at this you take the impact it's gonna have on the citizens in our neighborhood. I live less than three miles from it. I know where it's at. I know and I've used it. I mean, you know, I know where it's at. Kent's good people. The second thing I want to talk to you is about these incentives. <coughs> and uh, I see where you're wanting to give an extension to one that you already granted it to. Well, y'all know each one of you know how I stand feel about this. We granted these people a incentive. They did not meet their benchmarks, is what was said. They didn't meet them. So it's of my opinion, if you don't meet it, you don't get it. So you snooze you lose in their case they didn't do what they're supposed to do so they lose and we win and i say we win the taxpayers win because we'll get the money 
But if we're going to extend this thing, we don't wait for now six years to get this return on investment that y'all talk about. Now you're asking for two more years. So I hope that y'all think about this pretty hard and strong about why should you give this extension? Because they say it's about COVID and all that. Well, they got it in 17. COVID didn't start in 2000. They had three years to get things right before it all started. But everybody wants to bring, blame everything on COVID. If something goes bad, it's COVID's fault. <laughs> I'm tired of hearing COVID's fault. I wish he would get out of town. <laughs> so uh, I would appreciate y'all's uh, con consideration on this and you know think about this. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate it. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Okay, hey, these are the only speakers. Yeah, we can control Bruce over there. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't asleep. <laughs> he wants to. Be. <laughs> okay, we are now at the consent agenda. Motion to approve. I'll second. Uh, Chairman Paisley, on on my screen, I can't find any of the consent agenda, any of the numbers. It's like hunting a needle in a haystack. When I'm looking at um, 6E.1 Budget Amendment Family Justice Center, I just read something about the Governor's Crime Commission grant, because that, mm -hmm. that's a biggie for them. Sitting on that commission, I'm asking permission to recuse myself from that vote. I would be of the opinion that you don't have to do that, uh, but I'll refer to our yeah, legal counsel. I don't counsel. think that's necessary under the circumstances. You don't receive any remediation from that board payment for that board payment. I know, but I'm a voter, and I, I just don't want that to have the appearance of anything. I'm, I'm just real picky about stuff like that. I don't think it's required. But I'll leave that up to the board. If you choose to vote to allow her to recuse herself from the vote, then that's appropriate as well. Well, if you will, got I mean, me to walk. I've gotten to go over there and stand on that wall, so I wouldn't <laughs> be near y'all. So I'm gonna stop that. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just really, really dedicated to not having any kind of question. Well, we all serve on multiple boards, and uh, those issues with those multiple boards will come before us at a variety of times. Uh, we don't get compensated in a way that uh, would violate or create an opportunity mm -hmm. for us with our vote. So that's that's the primary issue. And one of the issues of uh, uh, being an elected official is that we're required to vote on things that come before us unless we do have a financial benefit from, the oper from whatever it is that's coming before us. Why well, does that consistency is real important? Ms. Smith. Deborah Betchel would put me on that wall, and she, I've stood over there three or four times just because of the question. Um, and if I vote, I'm not going to say nothing. Well, again, I, I don't know that it's required based on what I know of the circumstances involved, but again, <coughs> I'll leave that to the board. If you want to vote to allow her to recuse herself from the vote, the only thing I would say is that there are a number of items to be voted on in the consent agenda. So to the extent you want to allow her to recuse herself from that item, I would suggest you remove that item from the consent agenda and then vote on it separately to allow her to vote on the other issues that are included in the agenda. Ms. Thompson, are you making a motion? And if so, would you state your motion? It's um, 6E under budget amendments, 6E1. For Family Justice Center, I am requesting you allow me to recuse myself on just that particular line item. Second. Thank you, Craig. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Yes, we really can't remove a single item from the consent agenda, can we? You can. We can? Yeah, we can pull yeah, okay. any of them. Do you want to speak to the nature of the item? I can. Um, that budget amendment is no new money. It's actually closing out the grant. Okay. So it would be um, just getting our budget in line with the funds that were actually received and spent. Mm -hmm. So it's no new money in that. It's to actually close out um, the grant in the amount of $7,641.21. Okay. Well, I know I would I recuse myself from the, from the start of it. 
So I'll do what you want. You just you just know how I feel about it. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor of allowing the recusal signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, I'm going to have to vote no because I think there's no gain. Your family's not a member, whatever. I think there's, I think we're obligated to take a position in things of this sort. I'm um, okay. sorry. I respect that. So it's okay. for one that I get to recuse myself. So, well, but, you, but you are in the corner, physically, like in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> I think under the circumstances, you need to go to the far corner back there, Pam. Put your phone number in a Waffle House bathroom. So the vote is four to one for approval. Uh, if you'll step down, please. Really We're going to take. Are we going to vote? We're going to take the one separate vote on item six e one one at this point. Do we have a motion? as to approval or disapproval of that motion. I'll make a motion that we approve item 6E1, second okay. amendment to the Family Justice Center budget. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. Ms. Thompson, would Thank you please you. return? <laughs> Thank you. Now, <clears throat> so I want to, want to make a motion on all the other item six category consent agenda items excepting 6E1. I'll make a motion to the effect that we have approved the other consent, consent agenda items excluding item 6E1. Second. We have a motion and a second in discussion. There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. Um, if you're looking at your agenda, and uh, we have a new computer system that has just been put in place, and we had all kinds of issues and problems with that computer, brand new computer system. Uh, if you'll see with the agenda, the pages are numbered 1 through 168, 168 pages in our agenda today. Uh, but the normal category markings are not present. Well, they are on mine because I went back and marked them because <laughs> uh, it makes it so much easier. And uh, Madam Clerk, we're working on that issue. Is that correct? So do you think by our February meeting that will be, we'll have both the page numbers and the category numbers? <laughs> we have a non-committal. If you go to the other version, it is with the attachments. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Carter is pointing out, if you go to your digital version, it is there. With the so, attachments. Right. You have to click on the little paper clip icon next to the title, and then it'll pop up the attachment that you can then click on. Again. Please note that the oldest member of the board was the one that pointed <laughs> that out. <laughs> <laughs> what well, you know, the blind squirrel finds <clears throat> sometimes. <laughs> What page is approval of minutes? Or what page this is seven, presentation, other businesses? Page, uh, page 100. Okay, thank you all so much. The online agenda has page numbers. That was on purpose. Okay, we are now down to uh, item number 7A, Meridian Waste Cobalt Franchise. Um, <coughs> Ms. York, who's making that presentation? We are having it introduced from um, Bruce Walker, your assistant county manager, as well as Rick Stevens, our county attorney. Thank you. So, hello. So, we're um, starting this process uh, tonight. The process granting franchise to Meridian Waste LLC for disposal and operation of a construction and demolition debris landfill. This is this discussion of the proposed changes and the sale from one company to another. So overview, Meridian Waste has proposed the transfer purchase to Col from Cobble Sandrock Construction Debris Landfill in business. Cobble Sandrock has been a family owned business and established almost over 30 years in Alamance County. We started this effort last February, but we had to rewrite our ordinances before this process could happen. So they've been very, very patient and um, they're ready to sell and move on. 
We're here to discuss the details of Meridian's proposal, the legal process moving forward, and get some feedback from you guys and answer any questions <coughs> you possibly can. Representatives from Meridian Waste and Cobal are here to answer any questions, including Richard, our, our landfill director. Um, last time they were here, uh, we had some illness and we, we had to table it. And this time their CEO is ill this time, so we've, we, but we've got folks to answer your questions. Keep it real basic. You know, we're going to start talking legal and some other specific deal, but basically it's a local business selling to a North Carolina private business, a re so a local business selling to a regional business. County responsibilities approve the sale and approve the franchise within its borders based on our ordinances. And state responsibilities permits and regulates landfill operations. Okay? Now we'll hand this part over to Rick and talk about legal. Yeah, it's so like Bruce talked about. We saw some deficiencies in our ordinance last year. We took some steps to try to solidify that. We passed a new ordinance last year to allow us to for this transfer process to take place. A couple of things have to happen. Um, the first was the passing of the franchise uh, ordinance to allow that. We also have to pass the franchise ordinance at two meetings, this being the first of two meetings in which we'll have to enter. There's a, there's a franchise proposal in your packet. We'll need to vote on that and then a second vote with which we will attach a contract related to the specific terms of how this process will take place if the board decides to allow the franchise to happen. So a couple of things to think about with this. Um, our ordinance lays out some criteria for us to consider and allow a franchise to be granted under the circumstances. Three basic criteria to consider. Is the company in question able to render the services that they're requesting to render, in this case to run a C and D landfill service on the site that Cobal has operated that in the past here in Alamance County. Uh, are they likely to provide efficient and continuing service based on your estimation of their ability to, to do that business in other places, uh, their track record of success in other places, and are they the best to serve the interests of the county under the circumstances in question? So those are the things to keep in mind as we consider whether or not the ordinance can be granted. Um, if the board determines that Meridian meets the three elements as defined, it can grant a franchise to Meridian. What we're asking for tonight is for you to pass that franchise ordinance and to allow the manager to negotiate with Meridian to lay out the specific details of the contract under which they'll provide services to county residents and services in the radius they're requesting to provide services. The proposal that they have submitted to the county is actually in the packet, the agenda packet tonight. There's some changes they have asked for as to the way they provide service. We'll, out, we'll ask them to answer any questions about that. We can answer questions about that if we can. Um, tonight's actions aren't a binding agreement by the board. So if you pass the ordinance tonight and we're not able to negotiate a contract with Meridian in terms that are acceptable to us and to the board, we're not bound to anything. This is a unique process in law in that we have to pass the ordinance at two meetings in order for the ordinance to take effect. So somewhat different. There's not a public hearing requirement, but at the same time, we're having them here tonight to answer questions about the process if you have those. Um, and I'll let Bruce talk about some of the changes they proposed in their proposal. So some of, you've been given some of this, it's in the agenda, but again, Meridian Waste proposes from what Coble had already agreed to, increase the service areas from 25 miles to 100 miles from the county line. All right, let me stop you there. Yes, sir. There has been discussion about define I know what a hundred miles is mm -hmm. but we've been told everything from it starts at the county line not at the site mm -hmm. and that if another county touches us within a hundred miles it includes beyond that that entire county is that fact or fiction it's based on exactly how you write it so if it, I think the one of the um, original things are based on the county line itself I have a graphic to show you just kind of spatially what's going on. Again, as that as as the crow flies, so it's a little bit different. But um, you can specify that specifically um, as as we do the contract process. The second thing they propose that's a, a change is an increase the maximum tons per day from 600 to 750 tons a day. And depending on kind of the truck delivering waste, there could be a net increase in traffic to the area. Here's the map. So the orange is, again, this is from their actual location. It's not from the county line, from their actual location. Um, 25 miles is orange, 100 miles is yellow. Okay, so 
three times more. All right. Point out the exterior counties, if you will. So we've got Johnston, it's past Wake, um, up to Warren, uh, up to Cabarrus, right up to the Mecklenburg line, Iredale, Surrey, Yadkin. Again, that's the limit uh, as the crow flies. And would it go into Virginia? Yeah. That yeah. was my question. But yeah. Something to think about for the board to think about in considering this is the fact that they have asked for an increase in the geography of where waste can be collected from, but a 25% increase in the amount of the maximum per day to be delivered to the site. So those are two factors to consider and temper with one another in looking at what they're asking for geographically. Those are separate from the ordinance, correct? That's what they're asking for to be approved in the contract that would be incorporated into the ordinance we would adopt. Yes. In our second sense. vote, if we do so. Correct. Yes. All right. Does it go into Virginia? And actually, border of South Carolina? I believe so, yes. And we asked that question early in the process of negotiating things. Uh, one of the areas that we needed to research and make sure we were clear on is any sort of implication with hauling CND waste across county and state lines. Uh, I don't believe there's any regulatory concern there necessarily, but that is one of the implications, yes. Uh, we talked to NCDOT on a number of occasions. They will have to meet with them to go over their plans. Um, they were, you know, obviously out there on those roads. They've already had uh, large trucks going out through there. They did talk about possibly the entrance way would have to be approved. But again, without seeing their plans, they need to talk to them ahead of time and approve it. Meridian Waste will not continue the sale of Sand Rock, as talked about earlier. Um, the up, you could argue the upside of this is that there's no traffic going out selling that. So that reduces traffic going in, Tra net traffic in the area. Um, Cobalt C and D landfill businesses helped prolong the life of our landfill by taking C and D landfill at a lower price, um, and uh, they're the only C and D landfill in Alamance County. There was some questions about other kinds of landfills. There's plenty of organic LCID. There's uh, three with one more on the way, um, but those are organic. They call them stump dumps. Those kinds of things. <coughs> So we recommend during the contract negotiation process that NCDOT is completely satisfied with the uh, um, amount of tonnage increase. Uh, consider the increase in the insurance policy from way back 30 years ago till now, um, just because of all the new, you know, work with Richard and just in the past few years, the, the number of regulations that have been involved is, is magnified. Um, so, and I, Initial conversations have led to that. Um, and again, what we need tonight to re review is vote on the franchise ordinance, in including the agenda. If approved, authorize county manager to move forward with negotiating a contract based on the uh, discussion tonight and the direction from you guys, you folks. And again, tonight's actions do not constitute a binding agreement. So we're here now to answer any questions you have. Some of you have contacted us already, and but uh, Meridian's folks are here to answer any questions as well. So, I think one of the points that Bruce made earlier that I want to make sure we clarify and reiterate is the fact that even currently, uh, Cobles helps offset some of the tonnage that might go to our municipal landfill. Um, their tipping fee is thirty-eight dollars a ton for C and D waste. Our tipping fee for the same materials is forty-two dollars. So there's already an offset there and, and a reason perhaps to go to Cobalt to dump qualifying materials at a cheaper rate. Um, no reason to think that that rate wouldn't prevail and wouldn't still keep people headed there as opposed to our elements County landfill. Well, I understand. I think this board understands what C and D is and the type of materials. Sure. But would you expand upon that? Be glad to. So C and D landfills are permitted to receive construction and demolition debris. And that's treated in painted wood, drywall, vinyl siding, PVC pipe, insulation, etc. Can I ask a question? Yes. With all the school um, construction that we're doing, and I know many times um, when we went to add a classroom or something like that, we would discover lead paint all over the windows or asbestos in the wall. You break that seal, you got a hot mess. Um, if a school is torn down, all that's in it. 
does all that brick and wood and everything including those those things is that what goes to somewhere like this because asbestos was the best thing since sliced bread when it first came out uh, so there's a separate abatement process that's required for hazardous materials mm -hmm. that wouldn't be included in what's accepted in a normal C and D landfill. Okay, what is what's accepted? Is that zero, absolutely nothing? Yeah, so it's supposed to be none of those hazardous materials that have to be disposed of separately. Uh, so to the extent that it's known and, and identified as such, it's not supposed to go in those landfills. Um, I can't speak to the process for making sure that a load is entirely compliant. Again, we've got folks from Meridian on site tonight. I don't know if that's a question they might be able to answer for us. Um, Bruce, I don't know if you want to ask them to speak at this point to answer those more specific questions. Yeah. Sure. Come on. Wally's walking up here. Yes. I have um, some clients that are in residential treatment in Wayne County. I go through Johnston. They look like they have just discovered America because they are building roads. They're, I mean, I've never seen anything like it. Um, whenever they do stuff like that, they're going to have stuff that they're going to have to get rid of too. Mm -hmm. Just like um, Chatham's building mega sites, like Randolph County's building mega sure. sites. Is that the kind of stuff that comes into a place like this? If it Construction qualifies, stuff. If it qualifies under that definition. Okay. But. Good evening. My name is Dave Lavender. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Meridian Waste, <clears throat> and I'm here with Mary O'Brien, who is our Chief Marketing Officer. To answer your question out of the gate, that landfill currently is only allowed to take non-friable asbestos, which is basically your lowest level types that are not harmful. So everything else would be registered and have to go to a solid waste subtitle D landfill. So we would not take that material. And what's a sub? Look, that's a that's a writer. You understand, <laughs> that's right? a landfill yeah. that takes all the garbage and all the Is trash that like and everything Richard's else. Little world that, out that's there. that's yeah. Richard's world, <laughs> okay. correct? But we would not take that, and with, that would all be identified obviously during the demolition and everything of the schools. But you know, a lot of the construction and everything else that's part of our process. We would be able to take and accompany everybody within the county to take those materials into the landfill as they're building, and, and really just enhance on all the construction that's going to go on within the county. I can add that I had a conversation <coughs> with Kent about Kent Coble about the process and he said that they have cameras out there that look down into what's what's in the trucks and that the uh, attendants that help them offload the material out of the trucks watch for anything that comes out of the truck too that shouldn't be in the landfill. So yeah, that's correct. One of the other things I'd like to add, uh, Mary O'Brien with Meridian Waste, I'm a Chief Marketing Officer, is, is mentioned by the county manager, the level of regulation on these sites, as well as any and all disposal sites in North Carolina has increased significantly. And please know we are regulated by the state as well as federal law uh, and any ordinance that you all pass locally that we follow those. And the most valuable thing we have at a landfill is our permit. We cannot afford to get notice of violations. We cannot afford, just like you as a county, cannot afford mm -hmm. to get, to lose that permit. It is, as uh, previously identified by one of the citizens, a vital infrastructure as part of Alamance County that you have a, an environmentally safe and affordable means of disposing of, in this case, construction and demolition debris, such as your county landfill for MSW waste. Mr. Stevens, how does this impact the Hydro? Good question. Um, so one of the things that I spoke to Meridian's council about uh, recently is I do think that Hydro is implicated, and just so you guys understand, that's our um, heavy industrial um, ordinance. Uh, I do think it's implicated in much the same way that COBOL is implicated now in that the facility was constructed at a time before Hydro was a thing. So I believe they're grandfathered into the construction part of that process but the operation part would require an ongoing permit. Uh, I relayed that information and all the specifics to Council for Meridian earlier this week. We just, Alamance County seems to be the, the, bring it here, we got it, we got you. You know, cause we've just got these huge mega sites building all the way around us. And we're just really convenient that we would have this. Um, 
is that what makes us attractive? I mean, trash and attractive, you know what I'm saying. Um, is that what <laughs> makes us attractive for that because of everything that's going to go around that? Because you, you have to have these kind of places. You just do. Because um, we don't burn our trash in the backyard like right. we used to growing up. <laughs> so I'm just curious, is that what makes Alamance County it, a real magnet for this? It, it does make it attractive. And we want to be able to provide that service for the county as it grows. And... As you see, I mean, landfills are harder and harder to come by right mm -hmm. now. And with the airspace that we have at this site, we're going to be able to take care of Alamance County for a very long time. Long, none of us will be here when that day is done. But it's, it's, it's vital. You're exactly right. You couldn't have said any better. Well, understand what I'm fixing to say because I want everybody to prosper and make it. Mm -hmm. I'm all about pro-business. But if, if you're in the middle of a, a neighborhood, cause, and no matter where you go, you're really in a neighborhood. It's kind of like rezoning <coughs> schools. There's always right. a line. And, um, and you're in the middle of a neighborhood. We've had other situations that have gone into middle of neighborhoods. And, um, and that's just what it is when your county hasn't got a lot of zoning laws and things like that. However, um, with you're increasing this and you are really stretching out about to encompass the whole state, I can only imagine the traffic that's going to be out there. And one thing we've heard about another situation we've in the lower southern elements thing is the roads and being able to carry and, and these are big <coughs> trucks uh my son drives a cement truck so he's not like my little mm -hmm, honda right. and um and i'm just curious as to how we're going to keep a balance in that because you know I'll, i serve everybody in this county right. no matter what they do and i have to listen to them and i respect that because it affects them mm -hmm. and uh, i think about safety with schools and, and all kind of stuff like that and that's not a that is not a criticism it's just what we're looking at and I'm just really curious as to what you're increasing here, your your length, your mileage, and everything like that, plus your tonnage, what kind of effect that's going to have on that neighborhood. Because I get those calls. I'm like the trash queen in Alamance County. And I'm the <laughs> one that gets those calls. You can ask the health director. He's right. sitting right behind you in this police this sheriff deputy over here. So I just have to think that, too, whenever we look at making decisions. Understand. I have to really think about everybody's situation. I want you to make it because I know what you're doing is so needed. But at the same time, I'm going to be putting you right in somebody's yard, literally. Right. And I have to think about that, too, because they are taxpayers and they tell me what to do. Right. So, um, you know, just kind of give me an idea what kind of traffic we're looking at. Are you doing a traffic study? You know. Yes, we're, we'll end up having to do a traffic study with the North Carolina Department of mm -hmm. Transportation, or Transportation, like Rick said earlier. Um, you know, one of the reasons we're looking for the increase in the tonnage is we want to be able to grow as the county grows. I mean, because if we keep ourselves limited, then, you know, down the road we can be in a you know, it, it could become an issue for us. So, you know, that, that's one of the reasons for the increase in the, in, the, in the tonnage daily. Now, when it comes to the traffic that would be coming in, we, it would be open to every county resident from a residential standpoint. It would continue to have the commercial roll-off trucks and construction trucks that come through there right now. And then we would look at some transfer volume, with the tractor trailers coming in. Now, those transfer trailers are gonna hold a lot more weight. So just to give you an example, you have a roll-off truck it might carry four to five tons of trash on it a transfer trailer might carry 25 tons so you're eliminating five other trucks coming in on the roll-off business which will come off a construction site but then that's also going to be offset with uh, the lack of the uh, of the uh, um, cobalt going uh, going outside of it where we're not selling that anymore so I can't tell you exactly if that's a wash or not but I think it's gonna be very very close well, I want you to hear me loud and clear I have given my kidneys 13 times to get potholes filled in this county. And it's, uh, I need a wand because getting to the guy that fills potholes is a really challenge. And, um, and we don't make our roads like the Romans used to. Of course, right. they were six foot deep. <laughs> so I'm just curious as to how, you know, we're going to have to keep up with road maintenance. Because, I mean, I went to the ARC and went through West Virginia, and I had to get my tires realigned when I got back because I paid those tolls. Plus, I hit their, you could swim in some of their potholes. I've never seen anything like it. So I, <clears throat> I want to know about stuff like that because I don't want people waiting and have to go five miles up the road to go around something, and you right. guys mess up your trucks as well. Because it just happens. So, do you know Mr. DOT? Are you guys really like close personal friends that he's gonna come down here and fix every time that road messes up? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I mean, it's like kill. It's like giving a kidney. Right. And that right, Brian Baker. Don't ignore me. You're over there. You know what I'm talking about. 
So it's a real big deal to get that person because we have a whole state that has the same issues in every town and city. So, One of the things I'd like to say, first of all, no, I don't know Mr. DOT, but we also <laughs> we do run these facilities um, in North Carolina as well as the other five states in which we operate. And first and foremost, from the garbage lady Thank to the trash queen. Sister, I, I love it. Um, I, I want to address two things. First of all, you know, we see this facility, um, if we are successful in <coughs> purchasing it from the Cobles, and, you know, one of the reasons we like this is it's an existing permit, mm -hmm. and Mr. Coble would like to retire, okay? So instead of trying to site a new site, we'd rather take an existing asset and improve that asset. Okay, so that's one of the answers to why this site in Alamance County. Second of all, we believe that we will be able to enhance the finances of Alamance County by the ability to increase the amount of the host fee that you all are receiving so that it will be an economic engine to help fund road improvements, public safety, and any other program that the county commission decides is appropriate for that host fee money. When we give that over, usually on a quarterly basis, but you know, if we are able to negotiate a contract, you, know, you all decide how that money is used. And um, we want you to put it to good use, because obviously you know, we're gonna be citizens in the county as well at that time. And then to address your question about neighborhoods, um, most landfills, whether they're CND or probably your own county MSW landfill, start when it is just rural. Mm -hmm. It's just agriculture. There's not a home. There may be some cow farms, some horse farms, some chicken farms around. Uh, but what we all know has happened is those homes, those residential communities come to the landfill. And then they're surprised that there's a landfill there or that there's um, in industrial traffic associated with the facility. So what we do at all of our landfill sites, whether it's our two MSW sites, one in Virginia and one in Missouri, or our CND sites, one in um, North Carolina in Wake County, or in um, Knoxville, Tennessee, we make sure we bring the community to our facilities. For example, in well, I'm looking there, I was looking at the map, but Wake County, that's our Shotwell CND landfill. Uh, we recently increased the daily cap. There it was significant. There it was from 250 tons a day to 1,000 tons a day. Here we're looking at an increase of 150 tons a day. Not nearly as significant as what happened. Is Alamance County quite as big as Wake? Not yet. You know, we don't know what the future holds. But we believe that what we do is important and that we do it right. So we bring people to our disposal facilities. Uh, I'm in the midst of planning our Earth Day Easter egg hunt which will be our second one, uh, April 1st. It's not an April Fool's joke, it is true. <laughs> that just happened to be the best day. We're basic, last year, our first one, we had over 600 people come and do games like bounce houses and slides. We feed them lunch. They come in, they did the Easter egg hunt. I've never seen a thousand Easter eggs <laughs> gobbled up in literally three minutes, so we're gonna put out more this year. But the reason we, and then we do tours of our landfill. And the reason we do that is we understand there's a stigma with landfills. You know, people are afraid of them. If you come and see how we operate, there's nothing to be afraid of. The materials that we bring are what we're standing in right now. It's that glass, it's that wood, it's that sheetrock, it's that plastic cover on the glass. It's not leftover dinner, it's not industrial waste, it is truly just construction and demolition debris. So that's why we bring them in. Um, we do truck tours, like touch a truck events at our facilities. So they can, you know, kids love large garbage trucks. They make noise, they crunch things, they're cool. And, you know, obviously I'm a garbage lady. It's been a great industry for me. And we believe that what we do is incredibly important to the community and we believe in the community and we want them there. So if we have a facility <coughs> here in Alamance County, we're gonna do the same things we do at all of our other facilities. At least once a year, we ha ha invite the community, we feed them, we do activities, we do games, and we definitely do tours. Now in this case, you tell us how many activities you want. At Shotwell, pretty urban environment in Wake County, we do a minimum of three a year. But again, that's part of what we can bring to you, a community activity that people love. And, and quite often there at Shotwell, they don't even know they're at a landfill unless they do the tour. And so that's what, what we want to, one of the things we want to be able to bring to Alamance County through our negotiations with the county and, and hopefully be a business operating here in the future. We Let me have clean up one issue. One, we, the county, do not repair roads. We are oh. not responsible financially or otherwise for the roads. 
that's a state obligation or you know, other obligations, federal in some cases, but we, the county, do not repair roads and are not responsible for that. So although I totally agree with Ms. Thompson, uh, we don't want a whole lot of potholes. I envision Alamance County, it's grown so much. I have literally practiced law here for 49 years. Uh, that's pretty close to 50. Uh, <laughs> and I've seen a lot of changes. And I've seen a lot of changes in the roadways, uh, what the state, federal have put in money and, and uh, financial obligations to improve Alamance County. And I truly believe, particularly with what's going on in adjoining counties and Alamance County, that we will continue to expand, uh, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. um, right. Having said that, the roads 49 and, um, and some of those, they're going to change. They won't be little two-lane roads in the probably fairly near future. Um, so they will expand. Well, they'll have to. And that'll be a state or federal or some other obligation other than, I don't want the county residents to think that we go out and, and fill potholes because we do not and cannot. All right, okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. O'Brien, a couple of questions. You mentioned that, that that you would think that the host fee would increase. I think the host fee now is what, a dollar a ton? Mm -hmm. As part of your proposal, do you, as part of your proposal, do you include a recommendation on what the host fee should be? I think that'll come down to the negotiations with staff that's brought forward to you at that time. It's based on the ability, our ability to market the landfill and bring additional tonnage to you. And that's one of the reasons we're asking for the increase from 600 tons a day to 750. Do you have a, a range of what your host fees are? Is it what your host fees are in other CND locations that you run? Sure, yeah, at our Wake County um, landfill, which is Shotwell landfill, there is no host fee. Uh, in fact, I did a study of C and D landfills, mm -hmm. very different from MSW landfills, but C and D landfills in the that window of, of the 100 mile radius, none of them paid a host fee to their host community. When I did that study probably six months ago. It was six, seven months ago you did mm -hmm. it. Now, MSW landfills, different impact, different type of waste, they were paying host fees. So like the Cobles, we would like to pay a host fee to the county, uh, which is different than a lot of your neighboring counties that host or have CND landfills. But we want to increase that through the ability of marketing the landfill and the increased tonnage that we've asked for. Um, you mentioned the regulation piece when you first started your comments. Is, I, I would agree with you that that regulations uh, have increased um, their requirements over the years. But as I understand it, this site is grandfathered into the regulations that existed when it opened. Am I wrong about that? I think what you'll find is we look at building out new cells. We'll have to meet current re state regulations. We will not be able to get the permit to construct without meeting and or, and or exceeding state regulations to build those uh, landfill cells where waste is deposited. Okay. And that would be completely different than, say, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. So, okay, so the site now has a number of cells. If, if it's, if it's a, a cell that's existing that has waste in it now, it would be covered by existing regu or regulations that existed 20 years ago, for instance. But if you open a new cell in the current site, it requires new regulation. Correct. Yes. Yes, and, that, and that would include a liner? Is that... Is a liner part of the new regulations for C&D? Typically on a C&D landfill, they will not require a liner. Correct. Well, it's called a geotechnical yeah. liner. It's not okay. the liner that you all are having to pay for that's made out of plastic and welded together and is extremely expensive. It's usually based on certain clay and dirt levels that meet a um, anti-permeable um, criteria as defined by engineers who are a lot smarter than me. And then it has to be approved through the state too. Okay. Um, Mr. Walker, currently it's, we're averaging what about 20 tons a day yeah. at the current at the current CND at the Cobalt site about uh, 20 tons a day. It was about 30, I think. 30 tons a day. Okay, historically, uh, I did a study about a year ago. You would average about 28 tons a day over the previous year. You're saying now that you've ramped up to? Um, okay, so maybe we're at 40 or 50 tons. Okay. Per day. And maybe this is a question for Mr. Lavender. How do you anticipate ramping up to the 
the request of 750 immediately? No, it would take us, you know, a couple of years to get to that level. Now, I would say, honestly, coming out of the gate, we would probably see it go up to two, maybe 300 in that time, in that initial stage. In the initial couple of years? No, nah, we would probably be able to get that within the first three to six months. And then stay in there for a couple of years until it ramps up Correct. to 750. And then you you would see gradual, gradual increments of increase come up okay. from that point. So what I'm trying to get a sense of is, is how much traffic are we talking about with the increase from you know 50 up to 750, and it seems to me that there are two two types of trucks that go to a landfill. And correct me if I'm wrong about this, mm -hmm. but you've got like a a, 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 a single case. Uh, yeah, you'll have a, a roll-off truck. Roll-off truck, right. which is like a dump truck, or like yeah, it's a, a, it's a like little a, bit bigger, like and it's going to hold between three and five tons typically. And that's typically what comes into the landfill now. Correct. And there is some, there's some distance from the landfill where it no longer makes sense to carry one load and one truck to this landfill. Is that? That's correct. Accurate? So you know, those will be the, tra the tractor trailers that would. Come and so once you get way. outside of that, where where you know, if, if if I live in Orange County. Or let's say I live in Durham County. I might go to your C&D landfill and wake with a single truck as opposed to coming to ours because it's just too far. Right. Mm -hmm. But at, when you get beyond that, then you're looking at transfer trucks. And that's Correct. like a big, you know, big uh, what you normally think of or down, what, going down the road as a Correct. transfer truck. Yeah. Okay. Um, you've got a 100-mile radius. Where, where, where are you? Are, you, are those going to be coming from transfer stations? Or are those yes, they will come from transfer from? stations. Okay. Where are those? For example, we have one in Golston right now which is i guess what about 30 35 miles south of here and then we have one also in morrisville which is right over by the airport mm -hmm. so you know we would look at possibly bringing those in there and again the ratio i like to use is you know for every transfer tra trailer that you would bring in you would eliminate five of those roll-off trucks on a road capacity right so i'm just trying to get a sense of how many trucks we're talking about a day increase do you have a sense based on those assumptions for every hundred tons you're probably looking at five so you would look at if we were going to do 200 additional tons, you'd look at 10 more trucks a day, which would equate to about one an hour. What would be your hours of operation? Um, we would continue the operation, the hours of operation that are exist with, within the permit. That'd be governed in part by the high day. Is that yes. correct, Mr. Steve? We would stay with exactly with right. what the permitted hours are currently. And what is that? What are those permitted hours? What are the hours again? Seven to four? Okay, thank you. If you've got a CND station in Raleigh, why do you need a geographical area from Alamance County that includes Wake County? We would want to look at, because obviously that Raleigh marketplace is, is very big, and there's a lot of volume that goes through there. And, you know, they're, they're in a tight spot, too, on where they're moving their waste. So it would make sense for us to bring some. No, we're not going to bring it all. We would bring some of it into, into this landfill, not all of it. And if, through your traffic impact study with the state, mm -hmm. it's determined that you know, whatever road is not sufficient to carry whatever traffic you anticipate, what happens then? Do you suspend operations and, uh, under a certain volume until the road is fixed, or what is the process there? We would look at all and every type of alternate route we could come to get into the facility. But is that ultimately your call? I mean, if, if DOT says we don't have this road is insufficient you say we're going to take this road do they then approve that or I'm just trying to get a sense of what the process is is it is it on you to just determine how to get there or is it DOT saying wait we we would give our do this we would we give do. our best not guess but how we would want to bring traffic into this landfill now it would come from the south and obviously let's just say Raleigh for example right now so you'd have a couple different patterns or ways that would it would come in and that would be something we would have to share obviously with DOT when we came in and did the study and they would come back and say, heck it, this, this route will work or this route will not work. Here's another way we need to look at this. So DOT so already hand -hand. controls what you can and cannot transfer down the interstate, for example. Correct. And different roads and the capacities. Oh, that's pretty much governed by DOT, is it not? It is. That is correct. Yeah. So if it becomes necessary, then you would join us in asking the state or others to increase the road capacity and improvements to those roads, would you not? Yes, we would. Which could help Alamance County. Exactly. And the last question I have is regarding the host fee again, and I'm sorry to come back to that, but I had a thought. Mm -hmm. um, if we assume that having a low host fee encourages people who are in Alamance County to use the C&D landfill, which preserves the life of the county's landfill, 
um, it makes sense to have a lower host fee. Uh, have you ever had a situation where you had a different host fee based upon where the trash came from? That, that it was inside the county, it was a different fee than if it mm -hmm. came from outside the county? Um, I believe, um, and I've been in this business a long time, I believe that that is not a legal process. You can't have a discriminatory host fee based on in-county versus out-of-county. Could you have a discriminatory, I wouldn't say discriminatory, <laughs> could, you have a, a different, could you have a different host fee depending on whether the trash came from a single truck or whether it came from a transfer truck? Um, that would be very hard to decipher. Well, you, it wouldn't if, well, you, if you could see which, what truck's I, I, coming yeah, in. Yeah, I there. understand what you're saying. I mean, again, I am not 100%. I'm not an attorney. Uh, we could certainly look into that prior to us sitting down with your county staff. Uh, I just recall other cases where they wanted to charge in county versus out of county a different host fee that that was not allowed by law. I mean, you could argue that a transfer truck, uh, you know, has a greater impact on the county. Yeah, than well, I, I can a smaller assure truck. Right. any transfer truck would be out of county. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is mm -hmm. <laughs> the reason. Which goes DOT. back to so that coming in, and that's going to enhance the host yeah, fee. Yeah. DOT has already established weight limits on those roads anyway. Correct, and they've established weight limits on the transfer trailers also. Correct. Right. Just one quick question to comment. Chatham and Randolph, or to us, they're like southern Alamance. Out that way, snow camp, oh, just beautiful land out that way. If you're bringing stuff from their mega sites or whoever out that way, you're probably going to be coming through snow camp. And um, you're going to be adding to an interesting situation already with trucks. Mm -hmm. And um, you're going to come up those roads to get to Highway 49, which is kind of snow campish too. So, is because <clears throat> you're certainly not going to go all the way around to avoid that area, come down Interstate 40, and talk, I, mean, I just know how that is. I'm just curious if, if I'm just making a comment. That's a lot more traffic of great big trucks that are already heating up the road out there to start with. What do you think? To address that, um, we can establish <laughs> truck routes for those trucks that come from our transfer stations. That's okay? correct. Okay. Um, ABC roll off company, mm -hmm. we cannot regulate how that driver or owner chooses to make his or her course to gotcha. Cobble Sand Rock. Well, it has to be effective gas because that's not real cheap either. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's all. Yeah, we, we've, effect, we, we've established truck routes. We do that a lot. But again, those are truly only trucks that we can control in terms of our contracts. I know the Cobles are here. Do you want to say anything? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I may. <laughs> now you're bringing in the big guns. <laughs> <laughs> My name, for the record, is Frank Longest. I'm an attorney here in Burlington, the law firm of Holt, Longest, Wall, and Blates. Uh, we've been representing the Cobles for a number of years. Uh, we've been involved kind of in the background in this situation. Uh, to be candid, uh, the county threw us all a curve with the new ordinance that's been passed. And so the, the tradition and what's been done under the franchise and the prior procedures are now all up in there. It's all new ball game. I remind this board that by your new ordinance the way Frank Longest interprets it in the county. Attorney may have a different approach. But my understanding is that you have two items at two different meetings to do. Tonight, you're approving the franchise for Meridian. You have to make the findings of fact as to those three things that are appointed and set forth by the county attorney and the county manager. That basically relates to the experience, qualifications of Meridian as a future operator and, quote, franchisee of Alamance County. You have to also meet that this is a requirement, kind of like a utility. It's needed. And Meridian has the ability and expertise to meet this requirement that is good for Alamance County. Therefore, the night's meeting, according to the, uh, my reading of the ordinance, is that you approve or disapprove Meridian as a potential franchisee and a qualified operator under your ordinance. The second stage is what y'all are talking about tonight, what I call the weeds. 
<laughs> so yeah. if you approve Meridian as a franchisee holder, that means you as the county commissioners through your staff goes forward with the negotiations as to a contract. And many of the things Ms. Thompson mentions, you mentioned Mr. Turner, gets addressed in that contract. Mm -hmm. So it's not a condition precedent, these things that you're talking about, as to the night's job that you have of determining the first round that Meridian is a qualified operator and that you choose to be a potential franchisee of the county subject to your entering into negotiations that you agree to and Meridian agrees to for the future operation. Now, let's be blunt. My client would like to retire and go somewhere else on his farm and not have to be working to move dirt. He's reached that stage in life, he wants somebody else to do that for him. What we would like is obviously for the county to approve Meridian so that the second stage can go forward. Now, my client, Mr. Cole, certainly does have an interest in because anything that we do is going to be contingent upon Meridian becoming a franchisee of Alamance County, plus being a qualified approval for this particular landfill by the state. Now, there are several things that have got to be worked out. One of those I'll mention is under the current franchise, Mr. Coble has put up cash money or bond. By your new ordinance, and what I understand the leaning of the staff will be, that that will no longer be an alternative, but Meridian or whoever you choose in the future is going to have to get insurance, an insurance company what I would call a surety. Right. Whereas right now, under the current franchise, Cobalt is giving you surety by cash and also with an surety bond. That is probably old fashioned, just to be blunt. So your new ordinance is addressing some of the things that in the past have been traditional because of the changes at the state level, the state really governs the oversight of these landfills. I don't care what you say, I'm not trying to step on your toes, but the state of North Carolina has usurped you. Yep. You can remember when you were on the school board, how many times did you want to do something and the state education department says, no, can't do that. Every time. <laughs> well, my friends, that's what you're facing here now, but you have the say-so as to approving the franchise and then you have the say so to negotiate the terms the best you can at the second stage. And you have a right at that second hearing to address Meridian as to any questions that you're talking about tonight. Mm -hmm. If those haven't been approved by the staff in Meridian ahead of time. Now, you talk about, excuse me, being blunt, Ms. Thompson. <laughs> about about NCDOT approving things. Yeah. Well, Meridian's going to have to, in my humble opinion, do a traffic study and do that with the state. Yeah. It's not up to you as to whether that traffic's right or wrong. <clears throat> That's up to the people who make that decision. NCDOT and Meridian. Even though people may fuss at you, it's not your bailiwick. It's not your problem. Mm -hmm. And you get called up, you say. I don't have anything to do with that. <laughs> that doesn't always I work, Frank. Right. I know that, but, but, <laughs> but that's, why you, that to, to that's why you get to be have paid calls, is to have is the, the thick skin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you chose to run for the office, and you got to get some things that you know, aren't right for you. It's not fair for you, but that goes along with the job. Oh, yeah. but, but I'm pointing out to you the real McCoy is at the second round, not tonight. So we would request, on behalf of the Cobles, shall make a stand on the first thing, make the decision whether to approve Meridian or not as a franchise, to go forward with the discussions to try to work out a contract. And my opinion is, from everything I've seen and from what the staff has told me, 
it's hard to believe that Meridian doesn't qualify as a franchisee of Alamance County. I mean, they've got the experience, they've got the know-how, they've got the expertise, and they have done it plenty of places. So I think for the good of Alamance County, and you as public servants and making decisions for on behalf of the community of Alamance County, that you've got to pick Meridian. If they meet the criteria. Now, after you do that, again, to be repetitive, you get into the weeds and make the contract negotiations. Well, Mr. Longest may have started his comments by saying that we don't agree on the framework, but I feel like based on his comments, we largely do. Uh, and I appreciate him fleshing out for you all um, many of the details that I didn't earlier. Um, I do think he's correct in stating that this is part one of a two-part process. What we're asking for tonight is a vote on the franchise ordinance and a vote to allow us to continue negotiation with the Meridian folks in, in furtherance of a contract that would allow us to complete the process at a, at a future meeting. Do we have specific language for the uh, We do in on our the packet. There we is have a packet, yes. proposed resolution. Yep. It's on That's page right. 102 in our packets. And I would make a motion to the effect of that resolution on page 102, including all the factors that Mr. Long alluded to. Um, and it does specify the North Carolina General Statute numbers and that the uh, franchise subject to the agreement between, and we're authorizing our county manager and her staff to negotiate with Meridian in my motion that I'm making right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do I have I'll a second? second. <coughs> Excuse me. Have a motion and a second. Comments? I, I just need to say something. Uh, Mr. Longus, you know, I think you're just amazing. It's so good to see you. Um, the thing of it is, is and I, I want to talk, come here, come here. I, I just want to <laughs> tell you something that's like happened. We've had a landfill in Swepsonville and it's closed and we've ha we're having to check whales because okay. that's drinking water that's under the ground we can't see where that little thing's going but the last thing i ever want to do is have to become aaron brockowitz mm -hmm. and tear this town up. <laughs> um the other thing is we recently had a tear in our liner at austin quarters i used to go sledding down there when i was a young and it's just absolutely beautiful that was a hot topic too and we discover it but did we discover it before anything happened we think we did but we don't know that we just pray that Nothing's going to get in that water table. I work with prevention, and I'm all about that. Right. I don't care if you got, because all the money in the world, insurance. If something happens to cause damage, we can't fix it. It just it's it's right. always reaction. Um, and you know, and I'm concerned about this too because there's going to be some little sneaky people that's going to try and bring some stuff in there that's going to be underneath stuff because we are all human. We have an old nature and a good nature. That's just what we do. And that's why I'm making these comments because I don't want my county to be the victim of something like this because I serve every set of feet that walk in this county, no matter what age they are, however they feel about stuff or whatever. And I just don't want this to happen under your watch like a big accident because I can right. tell you guys are totally honorable and I don't question your integrity at all. But as a citizen who lives in this county, I want to make sure I'm not on 2020 or with Geraldo and he's down here talking about us because I am like a mama bear protecting the citizens of this county because they deserve it. They pay for everything in this county. And I don't have a doubt that this service is not needed, but I don't want everybody else now in this county to dump their stuff in my county because right. I look at it like that. I'm not some kind of giant trash can. And so that's, that's just my concern. And what I'm hearing is regardless, it's, it's done. We just have to sit down at the table and really good, be good partners to make sure our neighborhoods are taken care of. Absolutely. And um, and I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I already know what this is going to have to be, but I'm telling you, I'll find you. <laughs> you ask she me. Will. Here you go. What, what I can honestly say is we're okay because we're trash. She'll you. find me first. Let me yeah. go ahead and just say that. Yeah. And I'm She'll just find telling me you, I can't ask you to promise me this because I can't promise anything either because life happens and things changes. But we live in such a world that we are so careless with our world, throwing stuff out and just acting like it'll just happen to go away. We've got a gentleman, Mr. Walker, that comes in here and speaks his heart because trash going to the landfill right. now blows everywhere. We're just careless sometimes. We don't we need to grow up and be right. responsible. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm telling you, 
asking you in such a kind voice that I just want to make sure that this is done beyond right because I, I'll get the phone calls and, and they know I'll get on a broom and fly across this county for them. So that's all I'm saying. I don't doubt you in the sense. I'm just concerned about what can happen, which I can't control no way. Understand. Uh, one thing I will promise you that to the fullest extent of what I can do, what she can do, what our engineers can do, above and beyond what our permit states we're going to do. Okay. Let me restate, this is a C and D. This is not like the dump. It's not required to be um, a barrier. Uh, we're not leaking contaminants. It's a whole different ball game than the landfill that Richard oversees. Correct, but we still will be doing quarterly, monthly monitoring. I mean, there's a whole gamut of things we do through our permit and stuff we do even above that through our engineering firms to make sure we're always in compliance. I'm just pointing out it's a different ball game. Right, it is. No, You're I'm exactly sure. right. But you know more want it than I do. So well, we're on the control. same page, and that's yeah. that's a partnership. We, well, we're you in need this. to get over Easter Egg Hunt and buy plastic because they're so expensive. <laughs> People, Hill, chickens are the new thing now. Mr. So. Hill, did you want to say something? Yeah, Mr. Paisley, um, your, your comments are correct. Well, I want you to understand, like Dave and Herbert certainly understands, is that the EPA and the state of North Carolina are coming apart. Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. We're talking PFAS. <coughs> whether you're talking GNX, these are problems that I spend more and more time with than anybody associated with this industry is going to be spending more and more time with. So I think you have to assume that going forward as Meridian or any other purchaser of Copeland must do, as they look to go forward with new sales, it is quite possible that they will face the added aggravation, regulatory affairs, and costs mm -hmm. of having 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 7, ground cover layers, three pieces of vinyl, whatever it may be, because the state is very upfront, for example, transport stations. In the past, it rains, it runs off, nobody cares. About to change. Yep. We've already instituted things at the landfill having to do run off from our parking lots. So this whole conversation about environmental regulations, having insurance, provisions that you guys did years ago and getting out of the $1 million pack of money, this stuff goes on and on and on. All I'm telling you is none of us here know where it's going, but it is coming. And it's going to be more expensive and it's going to be more regulatory affairs that all of us are going to have to deal with. We appreciate that. that? Ditto. So you <laughs> Absolutely. Need to care <clears throat> and these guys don't know what's going to happen either, but they're smart people and they know it's coming. Richard, you only. Richard, you only used one word in there I didn't like, and that was assume. You yeah. all, we all know what it makes out of both of right. us, right? So, exactly. Um, and, and, and the other thing, I think a lot of what maybe people are having a hard time doing here is, is visually getting an idea. Let's put it in simple, I'm a simple engineer, I'm not a lawyer. So at the landfill right now, we're doing 400 to 700 tons a day of MSW and C and D. Why are we doing both? Because five years ago, I had hiccups and digestion problems because the C and D landfill at Austin <coughs> Court was beginning to exhibit environmental concerns in a way. It is an unlined C and D landfill, just like this nice one. I shut it down because it didn't make economic sense, and I was concerned about the Hall River and groundwater and everything else. Something else to think about. I have no idea where this goes. You ran a sand rock business. Can you get 10 to the minus 7 and 10 to the minus 5 centimeters per second squared density? I don't know. <coughs> and if you can't, then you got problems. You got any idea? Nope. Some, somebody needs to be asking themselves. You especially, mm -hmm. because that's your future. Mm -hmm. So there, there is a lot to this. 
So think about that 500 tons a day coming to the landfill. That's 200 commercial vehicles, just like you described roll-offs. And about another 200 people, uh, 200 residential vehicles. So think about that number, 500 tons a day. Now, Meridian wants to go to 700, 750. And a lot of you question, what does that look like? And I heard a lot of you people say, well, it's needed in the county. It's needed for the residents. I don't think so. We can take all of the C and D at the landfill right now. Dave, in all sincerity, three years from now, what percentage of your C and D is coming from county, county residents? Less than two percent. I mean, that's a hard question to answer right now. Very, very small. Because <laughs> it's not even a big percentage of your stuff now. So when we're going to bring in transfer trucks, bring in them, approximately 20 to 25 tons per trip. Am I correct? That's correct. Okay. You know by definition that you've got at least 30, 35, 40 of these large trucks a day. So put that in your conversation about DOT. I'm, look, I'm not here to beat up Meridian. It's, it's important. We love the idea at the landfill for you to be in existence because it takes some of the burden off of us. But I know there's problems down the road that all of us are going to have to face. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure this board, through Meridian, asks the right questions. And a lot of this engineering, and I know a lot of people don't want to deal with that, but that's the reality of it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Paisley. Well, I'm going to support your motion because I think Meridian meets the criteria for the franchise. I, I will disagree a bit with Ms. Thompson. I, I don't know that this is a done deal. I, I've got I've got some concerns with geography. I've got some concerns with the increase from what is essentially 50 tons up to 750 tons, which I know 600 is allowed now, but from a practical perspective, it's a 700 ton increase a day. Um, and I've got some concerns with insurance requirements to make sure they were covered on the back end if, if, uh, if anything should go awry. And I wonder if, if we might use some of the, um, of the host fee to, to look into whether the county ought to have some umbrella insurance above, above Meridians to stand in in case something goes wrong. <clears throat> yeah. Can I just, just address that issue okay. right now? We are required by state regulation to have financial assurance with the state of North Carolina. Okay. That includes closing the landfill. Let's just say, you know, poof, Meridian's gone, right. okay? and there's this private landfill that has no ownership, no oversight or anything. This has to be funded up front before they'll ever transfer the permit. Okay. okay? And that's no, not only for closure of the landfill, but the multi-year post-closure of the landfill so that it is maintained, the gas wells are maintained, the monitoring continues to be maintained. Mm -hmm. That's financial assurance that we have to put up before mm -hmm. the state will ever transfer the okay. permit. So um, I guess my point is, uh, I'll support the motion, uh, but I don't think this is done. We've got some work mm -hmm. to do. Thank you. I agree in that this is the first stage. We have a second right. meeting, which will be, I guess, two weeks from yesterday uh, for a actual vote. And in the meantime, as Mr. Longus pointed out, we've got to go through the, down in the weeds now and work out all these issues that Mr. Turner's talking about and all the others, but that won't be done tonight. Right. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion prior to the vote? All in favor, as presented on page 102, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate, appreciate your time. it. We'll see you Thank soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Commissioners, if I may, um, it may be more than two weeks before we're able to bring back a contract, so I just want to make sure we're realistic about that. It's going to take some uh, some time for legal to draft something on both sides. Okay, before we go to a break, I'll repeat that, please. Sure. I, I just wanted to clarify to that. that it may take more than two weeks before we're ready with a contract mm -hmm. that has been, one, reached, negotiations have been reached, but it's going to take some time for legal on both sides to draft an agreement as well. So. Right. We will move this forward expeditiously, but 
didn't want to commit to this being on your next agenda if it's not not quite ready. Thank you. We're going to take a 10 minute break. So now they're We're back in order. Scott. The cell phone. Good evening, commissioners. Good evening. I am Sky Sullivan with the director of the Family Justice Center. Um, I'm here tonight to ask to create a position starting in October of 2023 to start a Camp Hope America program in Alamance County. Um, I do have a short video and I'm going to make it shorter by cutting it in half just so y'all know what Camp Hope is because I think they do a better job than I do describing it. Originally I was going to have a video from San Diego but Guilford County, one of our um, neighboring counties who's had a family justice center and a camp hope program for a number of years just released a video and I think they just say it with that North Carolina flavor. so Bruce if you don't mind starting the video the Guilford County Family Justice Center started our camp hope journey in 2017 and have been running strong out here at YMCA Camp Weaver ever since then and camp hope is about giving children their childhood back it's bringing children into community yes. <laughs> Don't you love technology? I got it. Knobs always worked, didn't they, Henry? <laughs> the Guilford County Family Justice Center started our Camp Hope journey in 2017 and have been running strong out here at YMCA Camp Weaver ever since then. And Camp Hope is about giving children their childhood back. It's bringing children into community with one another, children who've been impacted by domestic violence and trauma, and having a week filled with hope and connection and relationships and community. In addition to working with children starting at age seven, Camp Hope also brings in college students as mentors and volunteers. We bring in our Family Justice Center partners as well, and we work as a team to ensure that we create a space where children feel safe, heard, and seen. I can see myself in a lot of these kids. I was more so of a Camp Hope kid when I, when I grew up, so seeing these kids, you know, it's like, wow, I can really be a role model and I can give back to the kids and show them, you know, like, I've been similar to what you guys have been through, but I've also, like, overcame, and you can overcome as well. A lot of them, especially when they're new, they come in just, like, so nervous, very quiet and shy, and then by the end of the week, they're screaming and yelling, um, they're trying new activities. There's a range of activities that we do here at Camp Hope, and those activities are really created around creating leadership opportunities and challenge opportunities for our campers, what we call challenge by choice. So whether that challenge is horseback riding and getting on a horse for the first time, that challenge is on the high ropes, or that challenge is found in trying something new like archery or swimming in a lake. We really expose children to a lot of diverse activities and opportunities for them to have self-discovery, but also create teamwork and connections with their peers and counselors. High ropes, I think, is one of our bigger intimidating activities and to be able to see the shift in their mind when they realize, oh my gosh, I did this thing that I was terrified of. It's like they can do anything. They're on top of the world for the rest of the week. My campers blossom. They, they definitely go through change throughout the week. They start very shy into themselves, and then once they're introduced to activities, other campers who've been through similar situations that they've been in, they just blossom and they show their true selves. The other unique thing about this children's program is that the community supports this. So funds from the community and our community partners all come together to make sure this is an experience for children that money doesn't matter. They can show up and they can have this experience at no cost to them. It's all about giving kids hope. You know, when kids are going through hard obstacles in life or tough things in life, they come here and they can be their self and they can uh, find hope in the things around them, friends, counselors, nature. You know, they see things that they've never seen before and experience things they've never experienced before. I believe that Camp Hope makes a difference in our community because I believe in raising up strong children, you raise up a strong community. Um, and so to be able to catch children as they experience or are being or are being exposed to trauma at an early age and giving them healthy ways to learn to cope and to deal with these very difficult situations that they're raised in to overcome that and to be resilient is the best thing we can offer to our community because one day they're going to be taking care of us, you know, and so um, we're just building up a stronger community and a stronger people, a stronger human race. Camp Hope is transformational. It's transformational for the children. It's transformational for the 
I said cut in half. I lied. I took 30 seconds off. Um, the, the main point of a Camp Hope program, though, there was this really great quote about um, the San Diego, is you can either love on these kids between 7 and 18 and try to mitigate the trauma that they've been through, or you can spend the time and money on these kids when they end up in jail as adults um, and end up as offenders as well. So this program has been part of our strategic plan since 2019, um, ever since we went to a family justice conference, family justice center conference. And um, I do have a letter of support as well from Judge Allen. This has been kind of his personal goal to bring this to Alamance County. In December, the request to start Camp Hope was brought to the Justice Advisory Council who voted to approve. So the next step is to bring it to y'all. Um, we already have an existing grant with the capacity to add this position in October of 2023. Um, that is a grant that you approved in around May, uh, June. So it's a two-year grant, and then we reapply January of 2024 and would know by May again if we get um, funded again for that grant. Right now, there are no match funds for the grant. Typically, we do pay match in the form of the facility and the and FJC director salary and volunteer hours, but right now, there's a match waiver because of COVID. Um, I'm not sure what other questions you have about the program. Well, and the facility in Greensboro, is that the one right outside of the little community of Alamance? in Guilford County. I'm not sure where they do there. So part of what we would do is go through a year-long readiness cohort to identify a good facility, good partners, and how do we fund this program. And two, where would you put this That's camp? That's what we would have to do through the readiness cohort. So we did apply to be part of the national cohort. We were selected. We were one of the few sites that was selected, uh, mainly based on our partnerships and because of our Family Justice Center structure, they thought we would be a good place to invest that, that time and energy in. So we would have two staff go through a year-long readiness cohort to identify all of those different things, including corporate sponsors and who are the partners and who are the mentors and who will be at the table. It is more than a week-long camp. It is also monthly mentoring activities and services for children um, but the main piece is that this position would be coordinating all of those different aspects of camp so they would plan they would find location they would get funding and the sponsorship for the children so cost is not a barrier um, and and create those pathways to those services have you looked at a partnership with the YMCA they would be on our list mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, uh, we're going after everybody as soon as we get approval now the grants for two years mm -hmm. so this will cover the salary and salary benefits, and benefits correct and for the manager for two years yes and y'all will then raise funds we will future. reapply for the grant and raise funds so there are some models where they get enough corporate sponsorships they don't have to use grant right. or local dollars um, and then we would look at that option but we're also looking at grant funding for that position too how well, much is the grant so the total grant we have is about five hundred and twenty six thousand dollars over two years um, and I'm, I'm not gonna say that's the exact amount, but it is close enough. Uh, we have been getting this grant since 2012. I just encourage us, this is an amazing program. We have so many mm -hmm. children that are secondary trauma victims of this. It is, you just have no idea. And I just wanna make sure if we get this and anything happens, we make sure this continues because there's nothing worse than getting a grant and really getting it going and everybody's set and they're looking forward to it and then you have to stop it. Sustainability is everything. And we, these are our children, they are our future and we don't want them in juvenile crime, JCPC having a meeting about them. They have the exact same right to a great future that all of ours do. And that would be the charge of this position. They're also looking at sustainability. Um, so as I said, writing many grants, raising funds, um, getting corporate sponsorships, that would be part of their job description as well. Well, it aids to longevity in the job, right? Mm -hmm. Will Brad be attending the yeah, that's a joke. <laughs> oh, he's going to be on the, the main task force. Yep. <laughs> he's the guy that's going to fly off that big thing at Kid Jones on The idea is to have the camp up and ready for uh, summer of 24. It is. Um, so they are making a special allowance for us because we have been so excited and ready as a community that we can go to a partner camp um, this summer to observe and bring a select few number of children with us. Um, and we're hoping to do that in Guilford so it's not there's not barrier um, transportation issues. So we may be able to identify some kids just to go with us to experience their camp and then be fully operational, not just for the summer of 2024, but really start the monthly mentoring and identifying those children in the fall of 2023. Do you have a sense of how many 
kids you could serve in the first I don't yeah. so it could be anywhere so if we brought folks to Guilford we're looking at six to eight kids um, some camps will serve 36 folks they could serve to bigger cities could be 150 at a time what you're also looking for though is that they engage in all of the activities so it's not a one and done it is very much changing the course of their lives by the monthly mentorship activities services and then the week-long camp um, I have heard from other camps so that kids that go come back over and over and over again so you would be open from when to when the camp would it be all year or mostly the summer or it would be activities during the year so those monthly mentoring activities and then the camp is for one week during the summer yeah so that would kind of bring in kids during the year that would wind up going to the camp during the summer yes and we would get clients from um, the victims we serve at the family justice center with especially when we identify child victims child witnesses um, from partner agencies school social workers department of social services sheriff's office we would be looking at a lot of different partners to also make referrals to us Do we vote on that? i'll make a motion to approve the request I'll second. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you, now. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. The tax guy. <laughs> <laughs> he just materializes out of nowhere, doesn't he? Yeah. <laughs> you need a theme song. He has to. That's what you need, like dun dun. Uh, that's what you said. Oh, goodness. Uh, See, what I need is the ability to dematerialize, just quickly vanish when the time comes, <laughs> oh. take refuge. Uh, and in awareness of the uh, lateness of the hour, I have planned a larger presentation. I can cut to the chase if uh, you would like. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, let's have the whole meal. <laughs> you can do that with Steve I, later. <laughs> that's right. I had a, I had a warm-up section. I think we're warm. Uh, well, I've been so, getting some calls from some of our constituents about uh, oh, about the announcement, and sure. uh, so I think the best laid plans are to let them get as much information as they want, so or might, more than they might want. So. Mm -hmm. Well, and this is my last opportunity to speak to the board before notices go out. So right. we're planning uh, the week of the 23rd to have notices out. Citizens will have the exact that. value for their property, and am I not leaning into the mic? <laughs> <laughs> right. We need an extension on that mic, don't we, Bruce? Right, right. <laughs> I'll try to talk into it. Um, so I think this is very important to, to get one last uh, chance to talk before the action begins. And I'll just cycle through some slides real quick, and you'll see all the wonderful things that we could have talked about. And we'll get to my favorite slide. And this one is, I ate a popsicle and ended up with $38 in lumber. <laughs> So the, the fundamental issue that we've encountered with revaluation is the rapidly rising market. Um, and, and just to take you through a quick walk through, the first I became aware of this was back in February of 2020 uh, when I read this article. In the first revaluation since 2016, homes in Wake County increased 20% in value from four years ago. Commercial increased 33%. And back then, 20% over four years was strong growth. Sure was. I was really impressed by that. Little did I know that we would have uh, multiple years of doing that much per year, uh, which is what we've uh, been going through. Uh, kind of the next indicator, this is uh, Zilla Research from December of 2020. Home values posted both the largest monthly and quarterly increases in Zilla records dating back to 1996. I thought maybe we have something special. This is from the Mevin Enterprise, February of 2021. Burlington, number two hottest real estate market in the United States. More recently, this is from the Times News, where they report typical home listed for 382,500, up 3.4 percent the previous month, 36.6 percent previous year. List price, 176 per square foot. And I remember 100 a square foot being good for a brand new home. Oh, yeah. And, and this is not for brand new homes. Uh, so obviously, we, we've had a lot of growth. And we've, we've spoken before. I won't go back through the, the math uh, where we did a stratification study and a trend line study. And we compared also to the statistics that Zillow had for market growth. But we didn't cover this. This is uh, Freddie Mac's house price index for Burlington. And so if you run it, 
with the beginning point of January 1st of 2017, our last revaluation, uh, through the, the last number that we have in the report <coughs> is August of 2022, they're at 94%. Now, that, I think the problem that they're having is they're commingling renovation with actual market growth. I can't believe that there's market growth numbers that would cover 94%. So they, they probably have them mixed a little bit. But still, it's, it's undeniable there's just no way to get around the situation that we have tremendous uh, growth. <clears throat> I'll catch up my slides. There we go. So there's no way to accurately assess property without acknowledging this rapid growth in value. Trying to make sense of the sales based on actual sale prices is an exercise in futility. Newer sales will be high, older sales low, it seems as if there's no rhyme or reason until you start adjusting the sales price for growth in the market over time, and then everything falls into place. Our values are based on time-adjusted sales. Uh, this is the correct appraisal practice, and it leads to accurate and equitable values, but it has a problem. Here's a problem. So John Jones appeals his new value of $220,000 for evidence, he offers a sale of similar property in June for only $200,000. Sarah Smith appeals her new value of $300,000. For evidence, she offers a sale of similar property a year ago for only $250. Barry Brown appeals his new value of $390,000. For evidence, he offers a sale of similar property in June of last year for only $300,000. Now, the tax department reviews these appeals and responds that everything seems fine. These upset individuals call their commissioners, contact the newspaper, and tell the world <laughs> that the tax department is either incompetent or corrupt and probably both. They even presented sales, but it did no good. Of course, what the tax department really said was, well, Mr. Jones, the market's been growing at 20% per year. If you allow six months of market growth, that's 10%. Your sale of 200000 plus 10% is our value of 220000 Miss Smith, the market's been growing 20% per year. Your year-old sale at 250 plus 20% is our value at 300 Mr. Brown, the market's been growing at 20% per year. If you allow a year and a half of growth, that's 30%. Your sale of 300000 plus 30% is our value of 390000 So... <clears throat> Trust is key. In 2017. With that argument, they're going to shake your hand and walk away happy. Uh, that's what I expect to happen. <laughs> <laughs> that, what, what you're seeing is my prediction. Henry would do that, wouldn't you? <laughs> In 2017, our, our last reval, the market had been growing at about 3% per year, and we could directly compare the sales price of comparables to defend our values. In 2023, we're going to be using time adjusted sales to determine the accuracy of our values. This leaves us open to persons asserting that we have adjusted the sales too much or that we shouldn't be adjusting them at all. The level of trust between the citizen and the department will be a major factor. If they come into an interaction with distrust, they're unlikely to accept our time adjustment and by extension, our value. Now, this is how we see ourselves. <laughs> We, we are hard-working, dedicated individuals. We are altruistic public ser servants. Uh, th this is us. Unfortunately, sometimes others see us differently. <laughs> now, I have to note the, the pig in a barrel. When I give a presentation and I have a slide to introduce the tax administrator, that's the image I use for myself. <laughs> it is a very good likeness. Uh, the other, obviously, a wolf in sheep's clothing. You know, we say that we're here to serve the public, but we're just here to get your money, right? So, so there's a different perception. And the reality is that we're not the first slide, and we're not the second slide. Who are we? We're people. We're just people, right? We work hard. We do our best. We make mistakes. We get frustrated. We get tired. Oh, but we have training. We have experience and expertise, right? We have good, good things and bad things. We're, we're people. So what I'm asking for is that I'm not asking for the board to trust us, but that you trust our process. When citizens contact you 
or speak out in public with dissatisfaction regarding their value, please encourage them to appeal and work through the process with us. And the tax department does not have the final say in the citizens' values. Instead, that power is held by a series of boards, commissions, and courts. So when a citizen is not happy with their value, they can appeal to the Board of Equalization. If we agree with the citizen, we will correct their value and they will not have to appear before the board. If the citizen agrees with us, they may withdraw the appeal. And if we cannot agree on value, the citizen will get to bring their concern before the Board of Equalization and Review. The board is made up of five fellow citizens from various walks of life selected by the Board of Commissioners. They will deal with our citizens in an even-handed manner and give them a fair hearing. Now, if the citizen is not satisfied with the result of their appeal to the Board of Equalization, they may appeal to the North Carolina Property Tax Commission. This will involve the State of North Carolina and the North Carolina Department <coughs> of Revenue to ensure the citizen is being treated fairly. If the DOR recommends a compromise, we can make a correction and the citizen will not have to become uh, before the commission. If the citizen recognizes the value is correct, they can withdraw, and if no agreement can be reached, then the five-member property tax commission will hear the case. If they're not satisfied with that, this is the, the bureaucratic model. There's always a seat above yours and a seat above yours. and So they can appeal this decision to um, the North Carolina Court of Appeals, and the Court of Appeals may agree with the citizen or county, and those decisions may be appealed to the North Carolina Supreme Court. So at every turn, the citizen is getting fresh reviews from different groups of various expertise and motivation. With each additional level of review, it becomes increasingly likely the value will be fair and equitable. This is true whether you trust the tax department or not and whether you trust the Board of Equalization or not, and whether you tr trust the Property Tax Commission or not. Each level of review is acting as a check on the ones below it. Please trust the process and encourage others to trust the process as well. So let's talk about the process. So when the citizens receive their notices, they'll be provided with a link to file an online appeal. They'll also be given a number to call if they prefer a paper appeal form. These appeals, uh, as they are received, will be coded into a computer system, and this will allow us to detect when certain locations or property types have an unusual number of appeals. One quick question. Yes. In that notice, will they have a reference to the um, Homestead Act? It lists <coughs> their, if they're in Homestead, it lists the Homestead amount. Um, but it doesn't include information on how to apply for a homestead or anything like that. It, it's solely focused on the revaluation of the property. Would it maybe not be a good idea to add that or is that a possibility? I, I, we could do it only by delaying the mailing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've never advertised homestead in the revaluation notice. We are putting that on our tax bill. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, we need to respond to these appeals in a consistent manner. We must not reply haphazardly. For this reason, we do not intend to hear walk-in appeals. This is an inefficient use of time, and it results in frustration if the appraiser does not make the change, or inconsistency if the appraiser does. We need to work through a consistent review process to deliver the most well-considered responses as quickly as possible. Citizens will be contacted as needed to review their appeal and will receive initial notice of our findings by mail. They'll be asked to respond with their agreement or disagreement with our findings. Many of our citizens' concerns will be addressed in this first review and will not need to proceed any further. Those who still have concerns and respond that they disagree will receive additional review and consultation. If we still cannot come to an agreement about their value, they will come before the Board of Equalization and present their case. Now, the Board of Equalization and Review will begin meeting in April and will continue meeting until all appeals are heard.
The board will provide notice of its decisions in writing, which will also include instructions on how to appeal the decision to the North Carolina Property Tax Commission. Now, tax offices generally prepare based on a rule of 10. Um, this isn't the worst case scenario, it's not the best case scenario, but we expect an initial wave of about 7,500 appeals. Many of these will be resolved with our first round of responses in February and March. We anticipate approximately 750 appeals being brought before the Board of Equalization and Review. Many of these will be resolved in April and May. We are prepared to receive 75 appeals to the Property Tax Commission. Most of these will be resolved in December. The Commission does not move quickly. Now, I am hopeful that we will not receive this many appeals, but we are prepared <coughs> and structured to receive this many appeals. If they come in at this level, we're ready to catch them. Now, in 2009, we were talking about a quarter of the county being appealed. If that happens, then we'll have to regroup a little bit. We will be able to manage it, but we'll have to, to add resources. I don't anticipate that. I certainly hope not. Um, again, I hope to have fewer than these, but these are what we're initially bracing for. <coughs> now, as of the setting of the 23-24 budget, we would expect to have all of the initial wave of appeals resolved and about 80% of the Board of Equalization appeals resolved. None of the Property Tax Commission appeals will be resolved at that time. So this comes out to about 97% of all appeals being resolved. We feel that we'll have a good estimate of outcomes of the unresolved appeals and should be able to provide trustworthy estimates for the budgeting process. I suppose we've been waiting for this moment. Uh, these are the results. Uh, some of this, I think, is already known that our 2022-2023 taxable real property value is approximately $11.975 billion. Now, for 23-24, uh, the revaluation amount, the preliminary, uh, because we haven't taken any of the appeals <coughs> off, is approximately $21.488 billion. That is an increase of 79.4%. Now, I was thinking that it might trend down slightly from the 78%. Um, and I'd spoken with, uh, with Thomas about that. That's my bad, because I was looking at the residential, and I was unaware that we had a number of pending commercial values. And when they locked in, it bumped it on up a little bit further. So this is the number that we're working with. I want to be clear about what that means, though, because somebody will say, well, uh, it went up 79%, and when I opened my notice, it went up 90%, so something's wrong. Oh, no, that's normal. Or they'll say, hey, mine went up 60%. Is something wrong? Oh, no, that's normal. There is a range. It's not uniform by any way, shape, or form. The type of the property, the age of the property, the location of the property, we're seeing very different growth curves. Uh, there, there's different desirability uh, if you're in town versus out. If, if, if you've got internet connectivity and good cell service, uh, you'll do well. But if you get far enough that that cell phone breaks up and you can't get high speed, that's problematic. And so it, it's just it's a mixed bag of, of, of values, hmm. the average being 79%. Average. Average. <laughs> if you're in the middle of the road. Uh, what happens when you're in the middle of the road? <laughs> splat, <laughs> splat. <laughs> Glad you said that, Bill. Are you telling me that my my property taxes on my humble abode is going to go up 79.4%? That's a good question. No. No. The value may, but I don't anticipate the taxes going up that much. It has to do with the tax rate. So if the value goes up by 79%, if the rate comes down by compensatory amount, it neutralizes it. So we're not talking about people's property tax bills, and that's that's determined by this board and what you want to do with the tax rate. We're talking about their valuations. Do you find that the number of appeals goes down once folks understand that? I think it will help. And and one of the things, I'm off script, but I, I should have put it in there. I'm encouraging people when they open those notices, if they say, I have no idea what my property's worth. Look, 
go to Zillow, go to Realtor.com, go to Redfin, go to HomeSnap, go to ePraisal, go all over the place, pull their values. I've been trying this. I've been pulling some of our values and, and reaching around, and I feel pretty comfortable. If they want to check us with those, go ahead and check us with those. Because usually owners, if they're halfway aware of what's going on, have some idea of the value of their home. And what I've watched is if you've not been in the market uh, for sale by owners, reliably, when we come across somebody, they're not represented by a realtor, they sell low, 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 because they have no idea. And so that's where I, I would really encourage people to reach out and get those resources. And if they say that we're high, please appeal. I want to know. Let me slow you down. What's mm -hmm. the time period for appeal? Sure. So they can appeal uh, immediately. We send them the notice. They can immediately begin the appeal process. Um, we're intending to run that through May 5th, Friday, May 5th. But we won't set the tax rate until June. Until likely the second meeting in June. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. What about all the people that don't have a check yet? Mm -hmm. um, my mother's 85 years sure. old. You're going to meet her. <laughs> but I mean, it's like, what? There, there's a lot of, we learned that big time during COVID with our families yeah. in school. Yeah. So what happens with that? Yeah. I mean, I think that if there's any doubt, go ahead and reach out to us. I would much rather take an appeal and work through it and say, well, you know, he, here's what we find. We'll, we'll pull our comps. We'll look at neighboring properties. If, if they are interested, we'll pull uh, online services for them. If, if they want us to, we'd be happy to help. Um, I would rather they do that and then feel confident about their value or find a problem. If there's a problem, we want to fix it. Then not respond and sit there feeling that they've, they've been mistreated, that they, they don't have a correct number. We don't want that. We'd rather they appeal. What well, with revenue neutral. Well, that's mm -hmm. where I was going. Uh, and they have zero idea until mid to late June, the tax rate. Mm -hmm. uh, people aren't going to have any idea. Is right. it possible to extend that May deadline until after we set the tax rate, or is that just out of, the, out of reason? We could. So the May deadline um, is the earliest that we could close appeals, and, and the decision there is I know that we're looking for a stable tax base. We want to know what we're dealing with when we set budget. So by closing that up at the earliest opportunity, the, the board can't meet earlier than the first Monday in April, and in a reval year, they need 30 days. So May 5th works out as our earliest closure. The idea being that they, they've had January, February, March, April, May, they've had um, four full months and a few extra days. It gives us time that the appeals cannot continue to come in as we're trying to set budget. If the preference is to just let them keep coming, there's no reason to stop it May 5th if we want to hold it open longer, but that's the soonest we can close it. But that, what would that interpolate to? And I got a feeling that's what Bill just did. Yeah, I did. <laughs> In a revenue neutral tax rate. It looks like it's about 50 cents. So there, there's a lot of moving parts with that. Right, so what we want to do is take the real property we see on the top, but also the personal property the vehicles, the corporate assessment, and get a, a base. Uh, and then we would take our projected, with an allowance for appeals, <coughs> real property, and then our projections for vehicles, or projections for personal, or projections for corporate assessment. And we would also include a projection for growth. Because the, the purpose of revenue neutral is not that you collect these same dollars as the previous year but the same dollars as you would had you not revalued. Well, if we had not revalued, we would have seen our year-to-year -year growth. So we would take that into account. And so I'm, at this point, I really have no idea what that would be. I just, uh, I've been waiting to get final numbers and present those. And then the next step is to begin to work on that revenue neutral and get early projections. And we'll be continually updating that. The, the real question is what happens on appeal. That, that's what I don't know. Everything else I feel pretty comfortable with. Um, what do you mean you feel pretty comfortable with? What does that mean? As far as the, the revenue neutral tax rate, uh, I'm very comfortable calculating that, except for appeal allowance. I have no clue. I, I really don't. I mean, I, I've got old tried and true numbers you can plug in, but I, I want to see it happen. I want to see appeals come in, and I'm, I'm hoping they're not as strong as what I'm projecting. Um, and, and two, th there's another factor with that. I don't know when, if we get a high number of appeals, 
if a lot of them will evaporate. Like there, there might be a knee-jerk reaction when you have that much of an increase to go ahead and appeal, but then when we start looking at data, that appeal might evaporate, or it might not. And so once we start getting these appeals in, then I'll have a, a educated guess right now so it's just a random guess. And we'll have to be really, really careful <clears throat> with my comment, mm -hmm. because if we extend the appeal time out, mm -hmm. then we don't know what we're dealing with. Right. That's my concern. When we set the tax rate. You're right. Uh, on the other hand, people don't have real num hard numbers mm -hmm. to deal with whether to make an appeal or not. It's a two-edged sword. Well, one of the things when appealing property value is they should not be considering the bill. The, the a bill or the I know that's but of course they're considering the bill. I would consider the bill. You like put that on there like so go, this is not a bill. Right. But but well, I agree with Mr. Turner's laughter. Right. The question is what is the home worth? So let's say that the home is objectively worth two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, but the bill is high, so we need to appeal it. Well, no. What is it worth? Is it, if if it's worth two fifty, if your bill is high, your bill is low. It's worth two fifty, and so really they have the information in hand. They've got the market data available now. They've got their values available now to make a decision about value. If we extend so that they can see their bill, what we're letting them do is consider the bill as part of it. Now, honestly, that would be advantageous. I think that when a lot of people see the actual bill, a lot of this will fizzle and go away because it, it takes that, that sticker shock out. They realize, oh, that's not showing up on my bill the same way that it is <coughs> on this value notice. But I'm very concerned because I don't know how to predict this. If we extend these things out, would we just end up with an unstable tax base when we're trying to budget? You, you just said fizzle. I don't think in, anything's going to fizzle mm -hmm. when somebody sees their bill and it looks like they just moved into a much higher expensive house that they didn't know they lived in. But see, that's why I think it'll fizzle. When they see the bill, they realize that it, it didn't really go up or didn't go up much. When, when they see the reality that's going to hit their wallet, I think they'll be happy. Until then, they're going to imagine what that reality might be. They'll say, oh, we're up 79%. My bill is up 79%. And, and that can cause a lot of anxiety. When they see the actual bill and say, well, that's not 79%, I think that fizzles it. Because we're, we're not talking about raising people 79%. We're talking about adjusting their values and then adjusting the rate as a counterbalance. Let me also add, we are writing sizable checks back to North Carolina every year because our valuations are so mm -hmm. out of alignment right. that we have to pay about a half million dollars last year. I forgot what the check was. Four hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Right at a half million dollars yep. that we were penalized mm -hmm. because our valuations were nowhere close. Mm -hmm. So just pointing that out. Mm -hmm. quick, quick question, yes. Mr. When did these notices go out? Uh, they're targeted for the week of the 23rd. Is it possible to have an estimated revenue neutral value by that time? Sure, we can. But again, I'm a big grain of salt with that because I don't know how to, to factor in appeals. It will be a rule of thumb for the appeal. Is it possible to put an estimated tax bill no. on the notice based upon the estimated revenue neutral value? No, that's very dangerous and misleading. Yeah. It's all based on when we're going to vote for the budget. So, so physically, can it be done? It could. We'd have to delay the notice a little bit because we'd have to change the notice, right? Um, the, the, the question, which I've heard in the room and I agree with, is I, I don't know that we can stand behind a, a tax rate, and we're kind of promising them a tax rate. Well, I don't know that we are. Yeah. But like an implied promise, though, yeah. isn't it? Well, you're letting, allowing the tax department to set the rate as opposed to the county commissioners. That's <coughs> what we get no responsibility. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can, can you just tell me why this is happening? I mean, why? Right. When I see 11, I see 21. <clears throat> Like, why is that hen laying in eggs? And every week they right. go up. It's the same hen laying in eggs. Tell me about eggs. it. Uh, look, who did this to look, us? Look, my, my egg prices are going up. But I mean, who, I mean, why not? We cannot stick it to our citizens. They have so much on them now. There is no so way. Think about a citizen that um, has equity in their home, right? 
that equity is value. And they can draw that equity out in a loan. If they were to sell the home and downsize that, that equity, they could go from uh, owing money on a house to having a house paid for by downsizing and taking that equity out. What we're saying is you've got 79% more equity. That's 79% more equity for, uh, for loans, for business, for loans, for home improvement. That's 79% more equity to downsize and, and be debt free. They want their value to go up. I want my value to go up. I sure hope my value goes up. I don't want my bill to go up. I want my bill to stay where it is. And, and that's the differentiation. We're not talking about bills going up 79%. We're talking about values. And people want their values to go up, mm -hmm. but not the bill. And that's where the tax rate comes in. The tax rate will ultimately determine where that bill ends up. What we're talking about here is the equity in the home. This, this is the good news. Your most valuable asset just appreciated. Um, and, and that's being driven by some very unusual market <coughs> factors. I, I've never seen anything like it. But what I can't deny are the sales. When we track the sales and we try to lay our values in line with them, this is where we end up. Can are you, you anticipating values continuing to go up or down? Well, I didn't anticipate them going up this far, so I don't know if I'm a, a good uh, <laughs> if I'm a good person to ask about that. I do not anticipate that. I think we're very near the the market peak. Um, the, I would describe the the real estate market currently as recessionary. Uh, everything I see is that the uh, list of sale is going down. The days on the market are going up. You know, there's just all these softening signs, but value follows that. It doesn't lead it. And so right now, values have not gone into decline, but I do see a tapering off. Uh, so I would anticipate either a very, very mild growth, flat, or a mild decline coming forward. Now, I certainly hope we don't have a strong decline. That, that would be uh, unfortunate, but I, I can't imagine that the, this level of growth can be sustained. Um, so well, I do think we've, we've topped interest out. Rates, interest rates have curved demand. Oh, yeah. Well, the ability the the ability to to buy the demand is maxed out. I, I don't understand how it can continue to go. I think Zillow's plotting the uh, project, projecting the growth rate. Of, I might be wrong, but I believe it was one point eight percent for the coming year. So it's way I believe off it. the growth. Mm -hmm. And I've watched a number of properties over the last year, and in mm -hmm. more recently, in the last two to three months, I've seen properties drop for, at first fifteen to twenty. Mm -hmm and then 20 to 30, and now I'm seeing properties drop between 15 and $50,000 in their listing price mm -hmm. or asking price. So um, I think we're at a point at which it's going to be coming down, but we had to do this at some point, and we addressed right. that back in February. Mm -hmm. um, the issue is when we set the tax rate, it's going to be based on what we have to have to run the county. Mm -hmm. not. It's not going to be an increase to our people, our, our citizens, of 79% mm -hmm. in the property tax. It's going to be a factor of that. And mm -hmm. uh, I just ran a calculation. You said 50. I, I, I ran the calculation on it, and I got 37. I had done a mental swag on that a couple of weeks ago to somebody I was talking with and said 38 without my calculator. So I didn't do too bad in my head. But um, Can you it's, it, it, I can't imagine seeing our rate drop from 65 to 38 percent but I mean if that's what it's called for it's 38 cents if that's what's called for that's where it could go but I mean who knows where it is right now can you imagine just just think about it real quick if you didn't revenue neutral didn't mm -hmm. do revenue neutral just throw a 79 can you imagine how many people would be in this building can you imagine where we, how, what kind of stakes we'd be on? <laughs> we're going to be in the witness protection program. That's what we're going to That's right. I've already signed up. I have it. connections. Yeah. We're going to be on an island. Mm. Well, I don't think there's anybody on this board that signed up to do something like that. So. Oh, no. just, just if you guys do something like that, I don't even know you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of here. Yeah. Well, and I would like to invite everybody uh, on Friday evening in this room at 7 p.m. We're having it kind of a town hall event. Uh, where the public can come in and we've got a, a presentation. It'll be a little bit of a longer form presentation. If you come, you've already got seats with your names on them. Oh, it's yeah. perfect. Uh, but just to talk about the reevaluation and, and try to get some information this out this, this Friday. What time again? Mm -hmm. Seven o'clock. So this mm -hmm. is like a big evening. This is oh, like yes. Jeremy's dance party. Uh -huh. So let me ask you this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. With, the, mm. with your dates for the equalization, Mm -hmm. folks 
Uh, do you have them scheduled to meet every day for mm -hmm. several days, or is this one day a week, two days a week? So if they come in that strong, we're talking two days a week. I mean, two days a week. And we, we did that back in the 2009 revaluation because we had so many appeals. Uh, it, it is workable. It is the limit of what is workable. Because of the recovery time for staff and the board, you just, two days a week is hard. It's hard on board members, it's hard on staff members. Um, anything beyond that I don't think is, is feasible. But we, we could do that. If it's not as bad, which is my hope, I would like to have one day a week. One day a week is, is very easy to manage. Um, but whatever it takes to, to get that done, that, that's our priority. But you can adjust that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So 7,500 is the number. That's 10%. Okay. I'm hoping for five. But uh, uh, I, I don't see, get everything I want. I, I see much larger numbers in your future. Oh no! <laughs> I've look, I've seen larger numbers in my past. I don't want it to be my future. <laughs> we don't ever like go out to the community during this time. Say like so many schools and have like a a community meeting so they can really ask what's going on because not everybody. I mean, we are not the housewives of Atlanta. The people ain't watching us. But in the papers, not everybody reads the paper. Right. I mean, you know, it's it's. No. Don't burst Thomas's bubble. No, over there. Thomas has got an extremely popular newspaper. They print it like it is. Oh, I found out Thursday morning up until Friday. I figured, wow, this is, I think I, every person who gets Alan Match mm -hmm. News called me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you know this? Nope. <laughs> but do we ever do that to really go out into the public and let them, you know, because we've done planning board stuff, we did mm -hmm. rezoning for the schools, and you're still going to have only a certain amount of people show up for that as mm -hmm. well, just because. People just, they need to be involved in everything, their government. But I'm just curious if, like, we would ever go to Eli Whitney's gym and have that whole community out there just come up and, you know, just sit back and have some education on this. So, so this is what happened in 2000, uh, 2017, is I thought that the, the best course was to try to, to go around mm -hmm. and have multiple, multiple public meetings well in advance. And uh, oh, we, we brought the, the coffee and the little packs of cookies and this stuff. We're going to put on a, a nice show. And what <laughs> happens is 12 people show up, oh. right? I think our big one, we got 20. But I've seen them before. Half of them in, are in this room right now. I mean, this, this is the thing that, that the same uh, in, engaged citizens will come to those meetings. And a lot of the others are like, ah, I've got my TV show on. What is this tax thing? Now, once the bill's in hand, you might get a room full. Uh, but I, I'm not crazy enough to be in that room full. Um, so what I, I decided to do uh, this year is to have just one right at the moment when folks are most likely to, to take interest, um, one big meeting. I, I hope to pack the place out. If 12 people show up, well, that's fine. You know, but. Uh, just just one meeting right at the end when people are most engaged and see what we get. We can always request additional meetings at a later time, could we not? Certainly. Well, and if, if there was, for example, just a, a real large amount of public upset and, and the idea is that we need to vent some of this, let's have folks come and talk, certainly I would be happy to do that. I don't think that. you would need our permission to do that. Yeah. 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 No, yeah, we wouldn't we have to. Encourage yeah. Encourage yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. And we'll do this again in four years. Yes. Are you going to simulcast Friday's meeting online? It's possible. We were planning to record it uh, so that we can cut it into informational videos to put online so people can, yep. can click and watch yep. and be informed. Did the municipalities, when they set their tax rate, use our numbers for yes. evaluations? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've had some uh, communication already, and tomorrow I'll be sending information to the municipalities to kind of get them kicked off with what their starting points are. Hmm. We thank you, we think. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Hmm. Again, Jeremy, give them the date this Friday from 6 to 9 <clears throat> in this room right here, correct? Seven. This, this Friday, 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Starting at 7. Yep. 7 mm -hmm. to 9. Mm -hmm. Get home in time for blue bloods. There you go. <laughs> you want to follow that now, Brian? <laughs> I can lower this. I don't have any jokes. Don't have PowerPoints. Got. No, I wish I'd have. 
thought of who I was going behind, but I will be more brief, promise. Um, so I have bringing to you tonight a request from one of our industry partners, Airgas. So Airgas came to this board in 2017, and we uh, entered into an economic development agreement with them, grant agreement with them. Um, we granted them a uh, economic incentive of uh, ninety-four thousand dollars up to f for five for a five-year period. That, that was slated to begin in 2019. Uh, they, in the process of building their facility, staffing their facility, and getting up and running, they ran into some delays. So, if, if some of you guys weren't familiar with or weren't here at the time that agreement was done, most of you weren't here when that was done. Uh, Air Gas is in Mebane. Uh, they are a biotech facility uh, that separates gases into their component gases, isolates those, and sells those to industries around the state. Uh, pure helium, I, I'm going to run out of gases really quickly, so I'm just going to stop there. Um, but that's what they do. It supports uh, manufacturing, supports medical uses. Um, they're a great company. They're in a sector that we as a county are trying to grow. Um, and that's why I'm bringing this request to you tonight. So they did run into some delays. Uh, there are a myriad of reasons for those delays. I have sat down with the, the folks who uh, built the factory, who staffed the factory to go over what those are. It's a combination of the fact that the 119 bypass was delayed in construction. They were required to build another road uh, to access their facility um, in order to build it. Uh, once they kind of finally got going, was right when COVID hit, and so they had a hard time staffing. Their demand went way down. They couldn't hire truck drivers. So I think it's a combination. Some of it's COVID. Some of it's just regular construction, supply delays. Some of it's road construction. These things all, all culminated into it just took them longer to get open than they wanted to. So what they are requesting for us is they want to get their facility up to the full value that they uh, promised but they haven't been able to do that in time. So they are requesting a two year delay in the implementation of our agreement. So they're still asking that it last five years, it would still be for $94,000 a year at its maximum, uh, but it wouldn't start until in their request, 2021, as opposed to 2019, which it would have originally started in. So they are, even if we do that delay, even if we start now, uh, in 2021, they're not at their full incentive amount. They just haven't been able to get to their final uh, numbers that they wanted to reach for tax value and jobs. So their revised incentive amount, even if we delay it two years, would be $56,000 and change for this year. Um, if we go on the original agreement, which was a 2019 start date, that incentive amount is $21,000. Uh, and change. So we're looking at you know a difference of, of thirty-five thousand dollars in the amount here. Obviously, it's it would end much more quickly if we hold them to the original agreement. So, 2019, it'll be over in 2023, versus their request that we start in 2021, run that for five years, ending in 2026. Repeat those numbers again, please. Sure. So the the. If they don't meet their targets, we adjust that uh, incentive amount on a pro rata basis. So the pro rata amount for this year is $56,628. Um, their 2020 valuation was $36,833. In 2019, they would be entitled to $21,710. So they're continuing to grow. They're continuing to hire more people and get close to their ultimate uh, hopes for proposed tax value and proposed jobs but they're not there yet it's just kind of a matter of when do we want to start the clock so they're not at their jobs target yet they are not quite at their jobs target they are 21 jobs their complete jobs total would be 35. look at page 131 in your packet that's the original 2017 right. contract with the uh, actual projected jobs and so forth and, and financial amounts mm -hmm. right at the bottom of the page. How many employees do they have currently? 21 as of the end of uh, 2021. I have and under the contract initially, they should have had 20 by December 31st, 2019. Right. 
They did not. They were they were at nine at the end of 2019. So I don't have their 2022 numbers in yet. Um, so we don't don't know those numbers yet. Can I ask what the average salary is? Am I allowed to ask that? <clears throat> you are allowed to ask that. I <laughs> don't know that I'm going to be able to give that well, to I'm you at this moment. A, uh, that's a real, you know. So as part of the incentive agreement and our policy, they were required to have an average salary amount that it's at mm -hmm. or above the state average. Um, that was not part of the agreement to know their to know their salary amounts okay. right now, don't so I don't me. have those. But okay. um, so they had a, a projected salary of average of seventy eight thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars mm -hmm. for December thirty one, twenty nineteen. Right. And the twenty twenty two December thirty first would have been seventy nine thousand two eighty six. So we do have average salary. They're projected. Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which have they met those? So we, as part of that verification process, when they apply for incentives, we make sure that they're verifying that they've met those numbers. We haven't gone through that yet because they haven't requested their first payment yet. So we don't have all those numbers in, haven't done that math, but we would not pay them unless they meet those numbers. But you were supposed to, you guys were, the county was going to write them a check in 2020, is that what you said? 20, yeah, so we would have written the check in 2020 for 20, end of year 2019. They didn't request that. Uh, we don't pay them until they make a request. So. Okay, so you, do you think they didn't make a request because they knew they had net their metrics? Is that why they said, okay, we won't, we'll hold off on, on asking this request? I'm just trying to get their thought process. You know, I think they were behind, and this was probably That's the last right. thing on their mind. I really don't want to jump into uh, speculating on why. But well, I, they projected 20 jobs, and they met nine, nine jobs. Yeah. Yeah. That's a pretty good indicator. I think that Mr. Mm -hmm. Ashley's correct. That's a yeah, I did. Assumption. So I do know that they've engaged with us in a, the conversation for a long period of time since before I took this job. So they've been talking with Andrea. Hey, we're not where we want to be. Uh, we're working on it. We're just behind. You know, we've had a, a dialogue with them. Um, I don't think we've made them any promises at any point that we would uh, postpone the beginning of the agreement, but. I think we've been having that conversation. Now they're asking for a two-year extension. Right. Meaning we start year one uh, this year or 2022. So year one would be as of December 31st, 2021. So they would be due their first payment in 2022. We're obviously a little past that now, but that they wanted to December 31st, 2021, as opposed to December 31st, 2019. And they still aren't going to totally meet that. They are still not. They're still not going to meet their their me. proposed which, amounts. Which means we don't pay them as much money. Right. We pay them a pro rata amount. <coughs> it'll, be, it'll be over half of, of what they maximum could have gotten, but it's not close to the 94000 maximum. Right. Yeah. I assume they make a request. Yeah, they will, make a, they will make a request, sure. You know, I guess my concern is uh, what kind of... Uh, what kind of Pandora's box are we opening by modifying agreements mm -hmm. like this? I mean, I can understand some of what they may have gone through, but anybody starting up a business has to anticipate that they might, you know, they, they can't, nobody can predict five years out. Yeah. You really can't predict a year out. Um, you can kind of get hopefully close, but a lot of times you don't, so. Well, they still, if we do nothing, they still can take advantage of all of the remaining time. Right. Right. They will still request and receive, presumably, uh, their incentive amounts for 2019 through 2023. Yeah. Do we know how many other agreements we have out there right now where they might not be meeting their requirements, where they might, where we might see, receive similar requests? That's almost an impossible number. Yeah. And you yeah, can't anticipate the future <laughs> that's what, what i just said yeah. <laughs> so i don't we haven't done a survey to see who hasn't met their numbers um i will say we we don't have any other companies that are actively having this conversation with us so this is a one-off as far as a company that's called us and said we're you know we're not there yet we want to work with you we're going to get there we're not having those conversations with anybody else there may well be other other folks out there who would come out of the wood. But as Pandora just mentioned. <laughs> sure. Mm -hmm. 
What's the board's pleasure? Um, I'm just trying to think outside the box a little bit. Would it be a good idea to defer this and take some time to research where we are and what kind of exposure we create for ourselves? Or We could certainly bring you a summary of, of existing contracts and who has or hasn't met those, those targets. It's I, I certainly would like to have an update on where we stand as far as negotiating other companies. Uh, what companies we've offered anything to going forward. Right. Uh, that would be very helpful. Um, we certainly should make sure that we tell these companies that we're going to talk about doing incentives with. I think the last one, StareTech. Well, I would just be firm, but frank, and say, hey, look, you make, you make the agreement, you live with it. Don't come back to me in two years and say, oh, COVID happened. I uh, couldn't hire truckers. I am sorry for those things that happened to your company, but that's what happens when you run a company. And in my instance, you run it for 22 years, you're going to have situations like this, mm -hmm. and not every deal is going to work out in your favor. Mm -hmm. So I would just be sure to tell these folks who are coming to Alamance County asking for my, my favorite taxpayers' dollars that we're firm and we're frank. We, we, when you enter an agreement with us, we expect you to meet any and all of your obligations simple as that yeah. and, and make no excuses for it. Yeah. And I really don't want to, I agree with Mr. Lashley, I really don't want to set a precedent of renegotiating after the fact. Yeah. That's yes. problematic. Mr. Chair, if I might, uh, one of the things that we address in this amendment, the proposed amendment that you guys see in your packet is um, we've tightened up the language related to payment and also the possibility of renegotiation in that amendment. Um, not to get too deep into the details, but some of the, the drafting um, was imprecise and we've taken steps with newer agreements that we've entered into to make sure the language is more exact as to what our payment schedule is going to be and the factors on which it will be based. Um, this amendment would bring this agreement more into accord with our newer structure. So not that necessarily should influence the board's decision, but the amendment closes a lot of the gaps that may exist in older agreements. And we appreciate what you personally Absolutely. have done with our contracts. Sure. You guys no, done no great, worries. Done a great job. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, I know with the PUV, when it comes to the breaks that farmers get and that kind of thing, if, um, it's discovered that they're not doing exactly what they signed up for. They get bit by Mr. Back on the Road back there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, um, I, I just think an agreement's an agreement, and you know that agreement regardless of, you know, we, we're adults here, and we commit to paying this kind of amount of money, and there's consequences, and I cannot even begin to understand how many small businesses went through train wrecks and even got PPP and all this other stuff and still got beat up. We're seeing that way food services, and I mean, it, it just was, did a number on everybody. And um, I, I, this is about integrity to me. That's that's just all I'm saying. When we sign things, we're supposed to honor them, and because they're at the beck and call of the taxpayer, which I'm one, you know. And I just think we need to have a standard, and we need to honor that. So, is it the board's desire to postpone this to next month and have the additional information over? Is it the, whole, the contract as it currently is, or is it to amend to the new proposed contract? Well, if you're looking for um, an option, I'll make a motion right now that we deny. I'll make a motion right now that we deny this. I'll second. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. We have a motion and a second uh, to deny the modification of the contract. Is there a further discussion? Just Mr. further discussion. Uh -huh. I haven't said anything on this, Mr. Chairman. I, I do think if, if the original agreement is flawed, it's at, least it, at least it's clear on what happens in the event that metrics aren't met. Uh, and that's you get the pro rata calculations, which it seems like they're, they're doing. Now, now, maybe the pro rata calculations in the first two years equaled zero, uh, but that's, that's what's in the contract. Mm -hmm. I don't see an additional additional time on this to change my view on this, which is that we should abide by the original contract. So with that, I would support Mr. Lashley's motion. Mr. Carter. 
Um, well, I'd still like to know the answer to the question. You know, where are we and what kind? Of, and, and I think maybe the appropriate time we have a retreat coming up on the 30th, um, and uh, appropriate time we, we plan to discuss the methodology we use to approve incentives going forward. That would be a great time for us to look at that and look at the situations we're in with other um, other. Uh, companies we've already agreed with and, and what kind of position that puts us in our future agreements. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of on the uh, cusp on this myself. I understand what they've gone through, but at the same time, it was a business decision they made to enter the agreement, to come here and do that, and they can't meet it. So, I'm inclined to go along with the decision here to um, deny the request. Mr. Larson. I'm good. Stop. I'm, I'm good. Yeah. I'm voting against it. Is, yeah, I, I, I think we ought to. I'm going to vote with your motion. Well, I sure do appreciate it. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor of Mr. Lashley's motion to not modify the contract signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? So it's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Good okay, uh, county attorney. Nothing further from me today. I look forward to meeting with you all and having the board retreat. I think that'll be a good time for us to flesh out some of the things we've talked about this evening. Um, I'll also just forecast for you that I'm planning on giving you a litigation update at the next meeting and closed session, but nothing else from me for this evening. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. County manager. Yes. Our next uh, meeting then will be your board retreat on the 30th. We'll start at 9.30. It's at the community college. Uh, a draft agenda has gone out. It sounds like I might need to do an update to include some discussion about economic development. So I will fine tune that and we'll get that released shortly. Also in your packet is the quarterly uh, management report. It's that lengthy financial report um, that does include a page in there about your American uh, rescue funds and includes your opioid settlement funds. So please take a look at that. A lot of the information or questions that you get are found in those uh, those multiple pages. That's all I have. I have a question of the county yes, manager. Sir. If we attend the June the 20th Friday 7 to 9, are you providing any kind of protection or shields <laughs> or <laughs> Don't answer that. <laughs> we can talk after. <laughs> the full power of the sheriff's office, right? <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. County commissioners. Nothing, thank you. Nothing. Nothing here? I have nothing. Ms. Thompson? Nothing. Motion to Is there a motion? Motion to adjourn. I second his motion to adjourn. <laughs> All in favor, okay. signify by saying aye and aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody was bound to change the mind. <laughs> Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other 
other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.